Okay, yeah, there's not very many today. Okay, Oh, sorry. No, so don't do it. You're gonna click on that. Oh, there we go. Okay, and you've got a mouse yep. if you don't want to use the trackpad. Okay. And then to get back over to where we just, you just click on oh, that right tab. there. Okay, okay. So I'm at just at the top. That's right. Perfect. Got it. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. All right. Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. The day after Halloween. How is everyone this morning? Good. All right. You guys had chapter four. So this is the test in the white book on page 184. Did you guys read chapter four and take the test and grade it? No? I know, Halloween. <laughs> no, I have a full-time job. Yeah. No, that's okay. I understand. I understand. All right. When I call your name, if you can tell me your score or how many you missed, Stacy. Thank you, Cassandra. Natasha, you said you'll get it to me later. Jenna. Dwight. Thank you, Dwight. Do you have chapter three for me? Thank you. Dalton? Regina? Okay. Cheryl? Brittany? Thank you. Nicholas? Angela? Felicia? Marie? Three? Thank you. Catherine. Thank you. Alina. Mariana. All right. I know we're missing a couple people, but it's the day after Halloween. So, <laughs> okay. So you guys read chapter four in your book and it was pretty complex. It went over all 10 body systems and it talked about the diseases in each body system, what the body system does, and most importantly, the normal signs of aging in that body system. The normal signs of aging is what you want to focus on. That's what you may be tested on because as CNAs, we have to report abnormal. If we don't know what's normal, then how in the world can we report abnormal? And that's really what this, this chapter is supposed to focus on. So it gets a little bit uh, overwhelming when you try to take all of that information in. Now, most of you, um, if you go on for nursing, you have to have an entire year of anatomy and physiology. So it's two semesters to... Um, you're going to have anatomy and physiology one, and then you'll build on it in two. So you start surface and you go deeper as you go. So it's very, very complex. And that's before you even get into the nursing program. And in the nursing program, they're going to teach you even more. So what we have in chapter four in the yellow book is really kind of a fifth grade overview. It's very, very general. I know it looks overwhelming, but it really is very, very general. So let's go through the things that I want you to know out of this whole chapter, okay? So the body system, right? Your, your body is made up of 10 body systems and they all have to work together to make the body run. And if something is happening in one body system, that means that it's going to affect others because we are like all connected, okay? 
Does that make sense? So think of it kind of like a city. So in a city, you have somebody that delivers the mail. That's a good thing. You also have somebody that picks up the trash, and that's a good thing. You got somebody that makes food, and that's a good thing, right? So all of these uh, things go together. What do you think would happen in the city if the trash guy just quit doing its job, right? Trash is going to build up. Now the mailman can't get to the mailboxes and the food people, they can't do their job because there's trash everywhere, right? It's going to affect other, even though the food guy has nothing to do with trash, it's going to affect them indirectly. Make sense? Well, that's the way the body works too. If you've got something going wrong in your nervous system, it's going to affect other body systems, maybe not directly, but because that nervous system has a job to do and it's not doing that job, it's going to affect it indirectly. Make sense? Okay. So we have to understand that each body system has its own job to do, but it's going to affect other, the ability of other systems to do their jobs as well. So the nervous system is where we're going to start because that's kind of our control center. That is where everything gets coordinated. So our nervous system is made up of our brain and spinal cords and peripheral nerves. It controls everything in your body. Everything is controlled. So when we got something going on in the nervous system, it is going to affect everything. Okay. Um. But our body is a factory. It, it, it ages, right? And every part of our body ages. So when we're talking about the brain, right, the brain, your brain is a factory that makes memories and controls processes. It's got a lot of jobs to do. But that factory is going to work best when it's bright, shiny, and new, right? Everything's going to be in tip-top shape. As that factory ages and things start to rust and the gears lose teeth and everything isn't working quite right, you're going to get less production. Make sense? Okay. So we have to remember that our brain controls all processes, but it also creates memories. So the memories that that brain creates when it's bright, shiny, and new, those memories are super, super good quality memories because the factory that made those memories is in good shape. It's brand new. So the memories that we make when we're really little tend to stick around a really long time because the factory that made those memories was state of the art when it made it. Now, fast forward 80 years that memory factory not working so well today. And this is why we can have somebody who's older that remembers the shoes they wore to a piano recital when they were 12, but it has no idea if they had lunch. Because the factory that was supposed to make the lunch memory, not working today. Just offline. Okay. Does that make sense? This is why short-term memory often gets affected as we age because the brain that's making that memory is not working at optimal performance. We tend to forget that. We know that we age, but we don't really think about the effect on each one of our body processes as we age. So it's very common to have short-term memory lapses as we age. Now, this is a little bit different than dementia. You're going to read about dementia this weekend. Chapter five is all on dementia. Dementia takes that mm, rusty factory process and just amplifies it tremendously. It actively sabotages the factory. Okay, So we don't just have a general breakdown of processes. We have a saboteur in place that's going to speed up the process. Does that make sense? Good. So as we um, age, some normal things that happen is that we end up with diminished senses. 
So that means that our sense of taste might be affected. Things that we really enjoyed when we were younger, eh, this doesn't pack the same punch. We may have diminished sense of smell because those uh, nerve endings that control that, they're just not working at optimal performance anymore. We may have a diminished sight. A lot of times you'll see older individuals that have glasses because they can't see well with the eyes that they have always seen with. That's because the eyes age. We may have diminished hearing as well, okay? So our senses get diminished. But touch is also a sense, and it gets diminished as well. So your patients, as they age, may not have the fine motor skills that they had when they were younger. They may try to pick something up, but their sense of touch is off. And when they think that they're grabbing it strong enough, they're not. And they may drop things. Does that make sense? So we have to remember that all five senses are going to age. And that can affect the patient. And that's why a lot of older individuals need help with things that they used to do all by themselves all day long. Because they may not have the tech, tactile ability to sense. Okay. We also have decreased coordination. This is pretty common, actually. This is why a lot of our older patients are fall risks. And that's because... When you're walking, that's a very complex process. Your brain has to tell your foot to step up. It has to tell it to move forward. It has to tell the other muscles in the body to balance. And then it's got to shift your weight forward. And it's got to tell this leg to lift up. That's a whole lot going on in that brain. If our brain isn't working at optimal speed, that whole process can be a little off kilter, which means our patients can have decreased coordination. So when we have elderly individuals, they're going to move a little bit slower and they're probably not going to be as coordinated as you are. So we got to use some patience with them, but we also have to be very mindful of safety. We want to look around and make sure there's no cords on the floor that they can trip over, that there's no rugs that they might slip on. We wanna make sure that their slippers are out of the way. We wanna look around because we know their coordination is gonna be decreased. We wanna make sure that our environment truly is clean and safe. So we have that closing again, remember clean and safe. Slower reflexes, of course, um, that has to do with the nerves and the decreased tactile. So if we have an older woman who is cooking, she is actually much more likely to burn herself because where you, if you touch the hot pot, your, your reflexes would immediately pull your hand away. Well, because all of those pathways have slowed down, if she touches that hot pot, her hand may stay there for an extra second or two before her reflexes kick in and she pulls her hand away, which means she's much more prone to injury. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, and um, we talked about memory impairment and decreased concentration. It's hard to stay focused when your brain just isn't clicking along the way it's supposed to. Okay. Good, everybody understand nervous system? These are all normal signs of aging, normal. Now, if we've got somebody that has all of a sudden confusion, that wasn't there yesterday, is that normal? No, that would have to be reported. Okay. This is a slow, gradual process like the aging process. Very slow, creeps up on you. Okay, let's move on to the cardiovascular system. Also a very important system because this is what is going to pump blood around your body. But again, your heart is a pump. It is going to move blood to your lungs and out to the body. And that pump is going to age. No way around it. It's in the body. It's going to age. So when you have a pump,
that is brand new, it's going to work at peak efficiency. As that pump ages, it's going to break down from time to time. It's not going to be as efficient. And that's what we see with aging. So we end up with decreased endurance. They just can't walk as far as they used to. They can't do as much as they used to without getting tired. We may have higher blood pressures as well. And that's because there's a buildup in the arteries that affects the blood's ability to get through. We're going to be talking about that a little later. Prolonged bleeding because our platelets just don't work the way they used to and they don't clot the way they used to. So we may end up with prolonged bleeding and fragile vein walls. So our veins um, are, they're kind of elastic. And if you poke a needle in them, um, they, you know, they'll, they'll kind of heal themselves. They'll stay in place. This is why we can take blood from you and it's not really a big deal. But as we get older, all of that fat that holds that vein in place goes away. So your veins end up rolling all over the place. And when we try to poke a needle in there, instead of the, the vein being elastic, it just kind of goes, ah. <laughs> and um, we end up tearing the wall, which have you ever seen an older, do you have somebody in your family that's older that maybe has had blood taken for a blood test? And they end up with this great, big, huge bruise. And you're like, what in the world? What did they do to you? Did they beat you while you were there? What happened? It's because that vein actually, in, instead of being elastic and accommodating that needle and kind of uh, stretching around the needle to hold it in place, when we poke the vein, it just kind of tears. And then all the blood that's in there comes out and that forms a bruise. So if we know that bruising can easily occur, that means we have to be super gentle with our patients. Make sense? Okay. Respiratory system is also a system that is affected by aging. As we age, we have decreased lung volume, which means that we can't bring in as much air as we do when we're younger. And that has a lot to do with the diaphragm, which is the muscle at the base of the lungs that expands and contracts and pushes air out of your lungs, but also accommodates air coming in. So your diaphragm being a muscle tends to get floppier with time, doesn't work as well. So we don't get as much air in. Well, if we don't get as much air in, this can affect our endurance, right? We get short-winded easier. We can't do as much. So less endurance, especially when we're trying to exert. Endocrine system. This is probably the most misunderstood system of aging. Your endocrine system controls all of your hormones. Now, we're pretty familiar with that aspect of it, right? Our hormones. We know that women go through the change at a certain age in life and that with men, testosterone declines. We understand those hormones, but our body actually runs on a whole lot more hormones than just sexual hormones. Thyroid is a hormone. That affects your get up and go. It also affects your ability of your cells to process energy. Insulin is a hormone. Insulin affects the ability of sugar to enter the cells. Um, there's a growth hormone and pituitary hormone and different hormones that regulate your blood pressure and your temperature. So there's a lot of different hormones in your body outside of the ones that we're most familiar with. And all of those are going to affect um, every body process. So as our hormone levels decline, so does a lot of biological processes. So we end up with sleep disruptions. Have you ever heard an older patient say, I just can't sleep? That's why. Um, decreased bone density is a very common effect, especially in women of Caucasian descent. Reduced metabolic rate. We just can't utilize the food as effectively. 
Remember I said uh, on Monday that we use food to create body heat? You guys remember that? Right? We burn calories. Well, if our metabolic processes are affected because of hormones, that means we're not burning calories as effectively. What do you think might happen to a patient's body temperature if we're not burning um, food effectively? Why they get cold, it lowers. It lowers, that's right. So not only does their internal body temperature drop because we don't have good metabolic burn, but also we don't have the fat in our extremities to hold what body heat we have in. So this is why our patients get cold all the time. And this is why, you know, you'll be sweating to death and they'll have a sweater on and be shivering. <laughs> Urinary system, of course, this ages as well. Urinary system is the bladder, the kidneys, the ureter, and the urethra. We end up with less bladder capacity, so your older individuals will have to go to the bathroom more often. And this is a great source of irritation for caregivers. Great source of irritation for caregivers. I just took you to the bathroom. Well, arguing does not change the fact that they have to go. So if they ring the call light 20 minutes after you take them to the bathroom, we're going to take them to the bathroom again. They can't help what's happening to their body. This is a normal sign of aging, decreased bladder capacity. We also pair that with incomplete emptying. So your patient goes to the bathroom. They think they're done. They get up, go back to the chair, and 20 minutes later, they're hitting that call light saying, I got to go again. Well, that's because they didn't completely empty when they went 20 minutes ago, and we don't have a whole lot of storage capacity. So we're going to be very accommodating. That's what we're there for, is to help them with these tasks. A lot of CNAs, th this is my pet peeve with a lot of CNAs. They will tell patients, just go, I'll clean you up later because it's easier. Yeah. Don't do that. That is a dignity issue. You are being paid to help these patients with the things that they cannot do on their own. Do not sacrifice their dignity for your convenience. That is one of my pet peeves with CNAs. Um. We also don't, uh, decrease our muscle tone in controlling the stream. This is why it can take a long time to start to urinate. And then it's very difficult. If they stop urinating in the middle, they may not be able to get it started again. Okay? They just don't have that muscle tone. Integumentary, this is the skin, hair, and nails. And some common signs of aging. We've already talked about that. Thinner, drier skin. You guys remember that? We talked about brittle nails as well. We covered that with uh, hand and nail care. We also talked about a decrease in subcutaneous fat. So that's going to affect your patient's temperature regulation. We also have changes in hair color, decreased hair production, and darker pigmented age spots. I'm actually starting to develop those myself. So we have some signs of aging in the skin system that are normal. What isn't normal are red, blotchy areas, bruising, wounds, skin tears, sores, those types of things. So we will, would want to make sure that we are um, reporting all of those. Reproductive system, yeah, that has a lot of uh, changes in aging, probably the ones that we're most common with. Uh, you can have hot flashes or night sweats. You can have decreased moisture production, erectile dysfunction. And external skin in the genitalia can actually become thinner and more prone to injury. So we want to make sure that when we have a patient, especially a patient that is incontinent, if we know that the skin in that area can become thinner and more prone to injury, we want to be very, very gentle when we're cleaning those areas but we also want to make sure that we're cleaning them thoroughly to prevent any irritation as well. Okay. See how everything kind of works together. We also have the gastrointestinal system. Um, this is probably the one that your patient is going to be most aware of. 
this will consume older patients quite often. Our stomach can't hold as much. We also have decreased senses and hunger is one of those. So we don't get at hungry as often and our stomach doesn't hold as much. So it only takes a little bit to fill them up. So we can have some nutritional deficits there. If they're not getting hungry and they're not eating much, and we know that they have to burn calories to keep their body heat up, this can set up a cascade effect. So we really want to be very encouraging with our elderly patients to make sure that they're getting enough to eat and we're not rushing them through meals because they're going to be slower. So we've got to make sure that we adjust our timeline. But you also will get other digestion problems like everything slows down, including your bowel movements. And your patients will become very, very hyper-focused on their bowel habits. Um, you're going to have to help them with making sure that they get enough to drink, that they're eating high fiber foods, that they're getting exercise that they can tolerate to make sure that um, everything moves along the way it should. Esophagus muscle tone diminishes. This is super important because this right here will set your patient up for choking issues or aspiration. We just don't have the muscle tone for swallowing the way that we do when we're younger. And this can allow fluid to go down into the lungs instead of the stomach where it belongs. So making sure your patient's sitting up straight, making sure that they're not taking bites that are too big for them, um, making sure that their dentures fit properly so they can chew the food adequately, or if they don't have dentures, that we're pureeing their foods. Um, so we have a lot of accommodations to make here. Constipation is very common and diminished nu uh, nutrient absorption as well. The um, intestines just don't work the way they used to. So the food that your patient does eat, they're not pulling as many nutrients out of it as they should or as they did when they were younger. So nutrient deficiencies can be very, very common. Musculoskeletal system is made up of bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage. And some common signs of aging here are decreased bone density, reduction of muscle mass, tone, or elasticity. And this happens quite often. We see this. This is the most visible sign of aging. Your patients get weaker. Their muscles decrease in size. They can't do as much as they used to. They can't walk as far as they used to just brushing their teeth may wear them out. Um, we can also have inflammation of the joints called arthritis, very common. And that's just because we've used our joints to their limit. They just can't perform anymore. So that makes them inflamed and causes a lot of pain. And then again, we have instability and coordination impairments. So we've already talked about that. Lymphatic system, your lymphatic systems drain excess fluid from areas it shouldn't be. So this is kind of a um, drainage, hi, good morning, a drainage system in your body. And if it isn't working well, then we can have a fluid buildup. A lot of times we'll see this in the legs because of gravity, right? Gravity pulls everything down. Well, your legs are usually down, whether you're sitting or standing, your legs are down. So gravity pulls all that excess fluid into the legs and you'll see swelling usually. Um, your lymph vessels lose elasticity so we can't really push the fluid back up to the heart because that's fighting gravity. So a lot of times uh, you'll see on the care plan that we want the patients uh, to lay down for 20 minutes in the afternoon and elevate their feet above the level of their heart because we know that that fluid can't fight gravity those lymph vessels just don't have the elasticity anymore. So if we can get them to work with gravity instead of against it, we can get a whole lot further. So care plan may have you put the patient down for a, a, you know, a rest for 20 minutes in the afternoon with their legs above their heart. So that's why we have beds that adjust the bottom of the bed, or you can use pillows to do the same thing. Any questions on body systems? 
That's what you needed to get out of chapter four. Okay. That's a whole lot easier than reading chapter four, isn't it? I'm not a fan of chapter four. Could you tell? <laughs> All right. So look at what we've learned so far. We've learned skill rules. We follow the... Yeah, every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves for every single patient. Remember, gloves aren't based on the skill. They're based on the patient. Um, we're going to use a barrier anytime we get supplies. That gives us a clean place to put our clean supplies. Anytime a patient's uncovered or undressed, we're going to use a privacy blanket. Anytime we use linens, we want to be super careful not to hold them against our, yeah, we don't want to snap or shake them, right? And if we don't use it, we discard it. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. Um, patients always have to be in where, where in the bed, in the middle of the bed. And when we're turning a patient, do we turn them toward us or away from us? Away. All right. Uh, anything that we have to wash, we're going to follow the washing rules. What don't we put in the basin? Soap. Soap. Whatever we wash, we... Whatever you rinse, you dry. dry. All right. Who gets to check the water temperature? The patient. The patient. What temperature should the water be? Warm. Warm. Not hot, not cold. All right. If you're going to put lotion on, what do you have to do first? What do you have to do after? Wipe it off. Very good. All right. All basins are clean the same way. Rinse, dry, store. Super easy. And then every skill is going to end the same way with the closing. Patient needs to be clean and safe. We want to make sure we open the privacy curtain, give them the call light, ask if they're comfortable. Right. Um, and then we're going to clean our hands, document, and clean our hands again if we need to. So we know all these. Not bad. You did a good job. Less than two weeks in. And you've got all of that under your belt. It wasn't too bad, was it? No? Yeah. All right. We're going to move on. Okay, this is on page 138 of your skills book. And everything that we've learned, we are going to apply to this skill. So we're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do the opening. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. We're going to get a barrier and our supplies. We're going to make sure the patient is covered at all times during this skill. We're not going to hold anything against us, and we're not going to snake, uh, shake or snap our privacy blanket or our uh, sheet. We are going to make sure the patient is in the middle of the bed at all times, and we're going to do the closing. So. All of the principles that we've learned are in this skill. We're going to learn a few additional steps that pertain just to this skill. Just a few additional steps. And part of that is positioning the patient to turn in a way that doesn't cause a lot of stress on you or them. You guys can turn somebody three times your body weight without any stress on you or them if you set it up correctly. And I'm going to show you how to do that, okay? So this is on page 139 of your skills book. These are our step-by-step -step instructions. And at the top of the page, you're going to see your care plan right here. So our care plan tells us to position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. So pretty simple. All we're asked to do is turn a patient onto their left side. But where do they need to be after the turn? In the middle of the bed. So if we're going to turn a patient onto their side and we know that after the turn they need to be in the middle of the bed, that means we're going to scoot them toward us first and then turn them. Good? Make sense? Okay, so remember, side rails are restraint. They require a doctor's order. We don't have one of those. Can we use side rails for the state exam? 
No, we do not have a doctor's order. It is that simple. So for the state exam, you won't have side rails on the bed. We got to learn how to do this without side rails. Remember the positioning rails are not side rails. Positioning rails, like what you see here, that is not a side rail. So you may have those on the state exam. All right, so let's talk about immobile patients for a minute. An immobile patient is unable to move on their own. So immobile means they can't move. So what are they going to need help with? Everything. Absolutely everything. If somebody cannot move, can they brush their own teeth? If somebody cannot move, can they feed themselves? If somebody cannot move, can they get up and go to the bathroom? Okay, so immobile patients are going to need what we call total care. Everything is done for them. Make sense? Make sense? Uh, it doesn't mean that they're unconscious, though, does it? You can have an immobile patient who is very aware of what's going on around them. So don't confuse the two. Immobile does not mean unconscious. So do you think we should be telling the patient what we're doing when we're moving their body? So even though we have an immobile patient, even if you think they're unconscious, it doesn't remove our obligation to talk to them. Okay, does that make sense? So when we are touching another human, they need to know what we're doing, why we're touching them, and how we're going to touch them. Can you imagine for just a second being a patient, laying in a bed, not able to do anything for yourself, and some stranger comes along and just starts taking your clothes off? Can you imagine the terror that you would feel not being able to defend yourself? That would be an absolutely horrible situation. And that will cause a lot of emotional trauma to our patients. We don't want to put them in that situation. So even when I have unconscious patients, I tell them, all right, Mr. Henry, I'm going to pull your sheet down now. I'm going to slide your body toward me so we can turn you on your left side. Before I do that, I'm going to put your arm above your head. I'm going to talk to them every step of the way and involve them in the process, even if they're unconscious, because I don't know how much they're actually hearing. Okay. So it's super important. Um, I used to work in the ICU for many years. And in the ICU, we have a lot of patients that are sedated. And we have a lot of patients that are truly unconscious. And uh, there were some nurses that I worked with that didn't think that it was that they needed to talk to patients when they're unconscious. They would just go in and do what needed to be done. And I had a problem with that. You know, it doesn't take you any longer. It doesn't cost you anything to use words while you're doing the task. I think that that's just a human thing to do, right? It's kind of, it's kind of a humanity issue for me. Um, well, we actually had a patient who was under what we call sedation, right? So we made them unconscious because he was going through some very, very serious things at, at the time. Well, when he, when we brought him back out and it had been weeks, he had a trach, um, it, it had been weeks. And when we brought him back out about two or three days after that, I came in and, and, and cared for him because I was off for a couple of days. I came in and cared for him. And as soon as he heard my voice, he looked up and the first thing, the first words he said were, thank you. So does it matter? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. So let's not forget that. Immobile does not mean that we don't talk to them, okay? But there's a whole host of problems when our patient's immobile. 
they're going to have all kinds of problems beyond just being immobile, right? Digestion slows down. Lung volume decreases, right? So they can't breathe as well. That's going to put them at risk for things like pneumonia or atelectasis, which is a hardening of the secretions in the lungs. Um, decreased bone density. This is surprising, right? We actually need activity for our bones to stay strong. If there's no activity, your bones start to break down. Your body's like, okay, we need calcium. We'll take it from there. And the, your body will start to break your bones down and cause osteopor osteopenia or osteoporosis, either one, which is a decrease in bone density. And it's all because we're not utilizing those, uh, those areas. So the body thinks it's not required. Um, this is where range of motion exercises start to come in because we want to make sure that we're doing some sort of exercise to keep our muscles and our bones in good shape. We also end up with muscle atrophy with immobile patients. The muscles just wither away and die because they're not being used. Decreased immune response. Oh, that's a big one because where is our patient? In a facility, what else is in the facility? Pathogens, pathogens galore. So if we have somebody who's immobile and we know they have a diminished re immune response and they're in a place with a lot of pathogens, oh no, <laughs> that is a recipe for disaster. So when we have an immobile patient, we need to pay really, really close attention to our infection control processes, okay? Now remember, we gotta do everything with these people. Immobile means we're doing it all. So if we're doing it all, we tend to get complacent and we stop paying attention to all the little details. Don't, this patient requires strict attention to all those little details. Don't get complacent. Cognitive function can also be affected as well. Um, that's just, your brain requires activity, input, stimuli. It needs, it needs input to function. Okay. So talking to your patient helps with that. Even if you don't think that they can hear, they may. And even if they can't hear and recognize what you're saying, a small part of their brain may still be engaged and you're helping with that cognitive decline, okay? Talk to them about the weather outside. Talk to them about Halloween. They know that life exists beyond them. Engage them. So the one thing that immobility affects the most, I haven't talked about. So I want to explain how, to, how this works, but I'm going to have you do an experiment while I'm talking, okay? Because I find it's much better if you're involved in the learning process. So what I'd like you guys to do in just a minute is take one of your hands, I don't care which one, take one of your hands and put it underneath your leg and sit on it. And you're going to sit on your hand for the next two minutes. Okay, while I talk. So just sit on one of your hands. Go ahead and sit on it. And you're going to want to pull that hand out. Okay. I mean, you're, you're actually going to feel a very strong impulse to pull your hand out. I'm going to ask you to please override that impulse and just follow me for two minutes. That's all I'm asking here, two minutes. And the reason that I'm having you do this is because I want to prove to you the effects of gravity on the body, okay? So we know we have gravity on planet Earth. Now, gravity is pulling your entire body weight through the lowest point on your person. So if you're standing up, the lowest point is my feet. So all of my body weight right now is being pulled down through my feet. If you're sitting, all of that body weight is being pulled down through your backside and the back of your legs, right? So gravity is pulling your body weight through there. Make sense? This is why we try to sit on soft surfaces. <laughs> it's more comfortable. 
If you're sitting on a hard surface for a long time, your muscles are going to get tired because gravity is pulling your body weight down to that point. Make sense? Okay. So even if you're on a soft surface like you are in these chairs, remember that that's going to have an impact as the body weight is being drawn down. What does that do? Well, inside your body, you got bones. Those bones are going to press down into the muscle. That muscle is going to press down into blood vessels. That blood vessel is going to press down into the layers of the skin. So you end up with, over time, this compression of all of those tissues. Well, one of the things in there that's being compressed are your um, blood vessels, the things that deliver blood to all those tissues and take bad stuff away from all of those tissues. So when you get this compression of those blood vessels, they actually crimp off. Now, you experience this when you sleep at night. When you lay down, you're on a mattress, nice soft surface, but your body over time will tell you to toss and turn. You'll stretch a leg, you'll reposition your arm. You're doing that because your body is recognizing, hey, there's some pressure here, I need better blood flow, move. And that is what your brain is telling you right now because you want to pull that hand out from under you because your body is saying, we're being compressed. You need to move. Just a second, you'll get to pull it out. Okay. Now, when we have a surface underneath pressing up and your body weight pressing down, what in between is going to be compressed, right? is going to have effects. Now this is gonna be amplified if the surface that we're resting on has wrinkles or any sort of a texture to it because that texture is gonna form an area of more concentration of pressure. So that's gonna be important in just a second, I'm gonna show you. So your skin and muscles caught between these two and without good blood flow, the tissues start to separate and that's the part that is super important here. We don't want our tissues to separate. So go ahead and pull your hand out. Now, remember, this only took about two minutes, but I want you to look at your hand. Look at it closely. Do you have color changes? Can you see the imprint of the fabric of the chair or your clothing on your hand? Okay, that happened in two minutes. Now imagine how much deeper those lines are gonna get in two hours. Does that make sense? Are you good? Okay. Well, why do we care? Well, we care because you were able to remove your hand. And if I let, if I didn't tell, if I didn't stop you, you would have moved your hand before I asked you to. You would have pulled it out because it got uncomfortable. Now, what do you think is going to happen to these immobile patients who can't adjust their body? Do you think that discomfort would drive them mad? I do. Can you imagine having an itch that you can't scratch? Can you imagine how overwhelming that would be? This is even worse because the body's tissues are yelling that they're dying. And body's tissues can get really, really, really loud. So this is important to our patients, not just for their mental well-being, but also their physical well-being. It only takes about 20 minutes for a pressure sore to form in the right conditions. 20 minutes. Well, you guys just proved it. You're healthy. You've got good nutrition. You've got good skin. And yet you ended up with marks on your skin in two minutes in the right conditions, we can have a complete breakdown of skin in 20. Make sense? Okay. So we need to understand that when we have a patient that cannot move themselves, we are gonna be responsible to move them on a prescribed schedule. General, General rules are every two hours around the clock. 
But if I have somebody that's particularly at risk as a nurse, I may up that to every hour around the clock. Or I could even do every half hour. How, as a CNA, would you know when to turn this patient? Say it louder. Care plan. Absolutely. Our care plan is going to tell us. So what do we do with a care plan? We follow it. Now, you've got a million patients to take care of. If you've got a care plan that tells you to turn your patient every hour around the clock and you think there is no way on God's green earth that that's going to happen, I simply cannot be in that many places at one time. Should you just ignore the care plan? No. And remember, CNAs aren't allowed to delegate. We can't ask another CNA, hey, can you go do this? So what do you think you need to do? Tell the nurse. Remember, we only have two choices. We either follow the care plan or we tell the nurse. Good? Make sense? That is a written test question, guys. You will have a written test question somewhere on the written test that gives you a scenario that you do not think that you can complete. And it's going to ask you what you're going to do. Okay. One of the answers is going to be to come up with a solution on your own. One of the answers is going to be to delegate it to somebody else. One of the answers will probably be to report your nurse to the board of nursing. That is never your job. And the other answer, which is the right one, will be to let the nurse know. Okay. I'll do the best I can, but I don't know that I can keep up with that schedule. Okay. Good. You will have a written test question on that. All right. So good? Imagine how deep those lines would get. So this is why we change position frequently while we're sleeping, because your body is reacting to this. This is why you're not a, um, so it's Halloween. This is appropriate. Anybody ever watch vampire movies? Right? Vampire movies, the vampire lays down in his coffin, does this, and he doesn't move all night. Right? Do you know why? This is actually, they, they actually get this right which is amazing to me, right? Because it's a vampire movie, but they actually get this right. The reason that you move is because your heart is pumping. Without a, vampires don't have a pumping heart. Without a pumping heart, there's no pressure areas. So they actually get that one right, which is kind of funny, kind of cool. And when you go to sleep, you're not a vampire. You have a pumping heart which means that your um, muscles and tendons and skin and other areas need that good blood flow. And when it gets cut off, those tissues start to scream. That triggers your brain and you move. Okay. So that just transfers the pressure to another area. So overall, we're going to do this every two hours around the clock. That is our benchmark. That's what we're aiming for, unless the care plan says otherwise. It should be every two hours around the clock. Now, some places actually have a turning clock on the wall. It's a piece of paper, looks like this, and it tells you between this side, you know, these two hours, patients should be on their right side, and then their back, and then their left side, and then their back, and then their right side, and then their back, and so on. So if I walk in there at uh, 1 p.m., the patient should be on their right side. I can look at the clock. I can look at the patient. I know that we're on track. Okay. So some places actually use this turning clock. If your place doesn't use it, you can make one. Perfectly okay. You guys can do that. That keeps everybody on track. And I prefer this because it, it makes sure that everybody is doing what needs to be done for the well-being of the, because in our life, it's all about the patient. Okay. But I want to talk about this real quick. So we start out with our patient on their back. Two hours later, they go to the right side. Two hours later, back to their back. Two hours later, left side. Two hours later, back to their back. Now, the reason that we do back in between is because we don't have as many blood vessels on the back side of us. We have more blood vessels on our sides and our front. 
So we, the back can accommodate a little bit more pressure than the other areas, okay? So back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left. Notice nowhere on here does it say stomach. Do not turn an immobile patient onto their stomach unless the care plan specifically tells you to do so. And the reason for that is an, if I'm laying on my stomach in order for my lungs to expand, my body has to lift up off of my chest a little bit for the air to enter my lungs. Well, if I'm immobile, my body can't lift off of my chest which means that you're likely to suffocate your patient by simply putting them on their stomach if their body can't accommodate that. Isn't that scary? So we gotta, we've got to be a little bit smarter than that. So back, right, back, left, back, right. Now, COVID just happened, right? So during COVID, what we found, and this, this really kind of surprised a lot of nurses, what we found was our patients on ventilators actually did better when we put them on their stomachs. And I think that has to do with the secretions that were in the lungs, the way they were draining. So my COVID patients will actually have on their care plan in the progression to put them on their stomachs. My immobile patients would not. Now, this is one of the reasons that CNAs don't make decisions. Because if you just became a brand new CNA during COVID and you saw patients on their stomachs and then COVID tends to go away for a little while and now we're seeing regular patients and we've got an immobile patient, you might put them on their stomach not realizing that there's a difference in the mechanism of action. So this is why CNAs aren't allowed to change the care plan. You simply don't have enough information to work with. Okay, good. Questions? All right, so to remain safe, where's the patient need to be? Middle of, Middle of the bed. So especially after they've been turned on their side. If you try to turn them on their side and you don't have them in the middle of the bed, they're likely to fall. So we've learned this. We're going to scoot them towards you so that they're in the middle after the turn. We've learned that. But what if they're immobile and they can't scoot towards you, right? I've asked the patient to scoot toward me, but what if they can't? How in the world would I turn them or scoot them toward me if they can't scoot themselves? And we're going to use a draw sheet in most settings. But again, you're going to go by your care plan. So a draw sheet is just a flat sheet, just a, a top sheet, right? A top sheet can become a draw sheet. You just fold it in half lengthwise, not short ways, long ways. And you put it underneath the patient so that the top edge, the folded edge, is between their shoulders and the two um, parts that come together are between their, uh, under their thigh, between their hip and knee, somewhere in there, depending on how big our patient is. And then we use it like a sling. We stand on one side, we roll the sheet, and we pull their body weight toward us. Super easy. So draw sheets can work. But if I've got a patient with compression fractures because of severe osteoporosis, if we do this, we might crush their vertebrae. So do we use draw sheets without the care plan telling us to? No. We need to know everything we're allowed to do with the patient because every patient is different. We can't assume that one size fits all. If we can't use a draw sheet, we can use the um, segment method where we, we move their head and shoulders, their torso, their hips, their legs. We also have something called a slide sheet or a slip sheet. You'll hear it both ways. This is like super cool. This is a super slippery, but not wet material that you put underneath the patient and it almost levitates them. I mean, you just like no pressure just slides right across. They're super crazy effective. The problem is they're crazy expensive. 
which means it's probably locked up in a manager's office somewhere and you got to sign it out so they know who's got it. You got to sign it back in so they know it was returned because these things are like crazy expensive, but it's effective. Now, I wouldn't want to use it if I got a patient with third degree burns all along their backside because you don't want to slide them. Draw sheet would be much more effective. Good? Make sense? So you're going to use the method relayed to you in the care plan. But for the test, thankfully, they make this super easy for us. Super, super easy. Your patient can just scoot. <laughs> because it does not tell us in our care plan that our patient is immobile. It just says they can't turn on their own. So think of this patient as maybe somebody who just had the abdominal surgery and has an incision from here to here. They can't flip their body over. They need some help. But it doesn't say that they're immobile, does it? Careful not to read anything into your care plan that's not there. All right, so in order to turn our patient, we're going to position them properly. Remember I told you you can turn somebody three times your own body weight as long as you position them properly. And this is the proper way to position. So the furthest arm goes up over their head like this. The closest arm is going to cross their chest. So if I'm going to turn them onto their left side, remember, I have to remain behind the patient's behind, right? Right? So if I'm going to turn the patient onto their left, that means I've got to be on the right side of the bed. So the furthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses the chest, just like this. If I were going to turn them on their right side, I would need to be on the left side of the bed and the furthest arm goes up and the closest arm crosses the chest like this. So this way or this way, depending on where you're standing on the side of the bed. Good. Notice it doesn't say right arm or left arm. It says furthest arm and closest arm. Now, that's for the top half. The bottom half, we're going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. So they're like this. The furthest knee angles out. Now, when you do this, your patient is almost on their side already. It takes very little effort at all. A hand on the shoulder, a hand on the hip, and you just finish rolling them. No stress on them, no stress on you. Good. Questions? So let's review this one more time. Furthest arm up, closest arm crosses, closest knee bent with the foot on the bed, furthest knee angled out. So this is how your patient will look. Okay. Now, once we get them rolled, we got to use something to keep them there because gravity is going to pull them right back onto their back if we don't. You'll get them on their side. 20 minutes later, you'll go back to check on them and they're back on their back. And now they're close to the edge of the bed because remember, they rolled. So we've got to use some pillows to keep them there. The way we place the pillows counts. And I'm going to unfortunately make this look way easy, easier than it is. And it's only because I've been doing this forever and I don't know how to make it look hard anymore. So the first pillow we're going to put behind the back. We're going to tuck it one edge under the patient. And then we're going to roll it up and tuck the second edge under the patient so it becomes a roll behind their back. Then we're going to put a pillow between their legs, specifically between the knees and ankles. We don't want those bony areas rubbing together. So we want something to separate them. So between the knees and ankles. The top arm it kind of rolls down, and that puts a lot of pressure along the arm, up the neck, into the, the base of the, the skull. That can cause headaches and muscle spasms and tension. So we want to put a pillow under that top arm just to get him in a neutral position. Be careful. We don't want that pillow over the face. Makes sense. And then we're going to adjust the pillow that's already on the bed under the head to make sure it's just under the head and neck and not that shoulder. So this skill is going to require three additional pillows in addition to the one already on the bed. Questions? 
Okay, so let's look at this care plan one more time before I show you the skill. It says position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on side and is unable to assist with turning. Notice the care plan does not say that they're immobile. It does not say that they're unconscious. It just says that they're unable to turn themselves. Don't read more into the care plan than what's there. Okay. Oops. All right. Oops, come back, come back. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you this skill. I need a volunteer. Can you, uh, okay, good. You don't have a jacket on, good. Okay, no, just lay down. Let me see if I can get my thing to work here. Your videos. Is that your husband? That is my son. Is that your son? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can I get you to lift your feet up real quick? Thank you. Yeah, he's uh he I keep him for my patient. We've tried, if you look at my really, really, really old videos, you'll see some other people in there. Um but I keep going back to him and, and we're gonna retape the videos on Christmas break. So I've got we'll have some new ones coming in the first of the year. But I always use him because if you watch the videos, he's really good about not making it about him. Most people, when a camera turns on them, they start hamming it up. And it's kind of subconscious. You don't even realize you're doing it. He's really, really good about keeping the focus on the skill, not on him. And that's why I, I use him because he's got a very specific talent there. So, um, yeah, he doesn't like it. But, you know, <laughs> mom voluntold him. So. All right, so I am going to do this entire skill from beginning to end, including hand washing. So you'll see how this whole skill will go because this is my first skill of the, the day, right? Your first skill of the test, you're going to have to wash your hands at the beginning and at the end. So here we go. Good morning, Miss Jones. How are you? Good. My name is Patty and I'm your CNA today. I'm going to be turning you onto your left side. Is that okay? All right, I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. So I'm going to close the curtain and go wash my hands. So let me grab the soap. Hold on. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to turn the faucet on and make the water warm, whatever's comfortable for me. Wet my hands, wet my hands and get lots of soap because I'm graded on bubble production. I'm going to start to rub and look at the clock. I need to rub for 20 seconds. So I'm going to rub the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands and in between my fingers, in between my thumb and index finger, the bottom of my hand by my pinky and the palm of my hand. And that is 20 seconds. And I'm going to go down each one of my nails with my thumb. I'm going to circle the nails on the palm of my hand. And I'll rinse. Careful not to touch the sink or the faucet. And now I'm going to tap, keep the water confined to the sink. And I'll get some paper towels to dry my hands. Once I've dried my hands, Throw those away, get a clean, dry paper towel to turn the faucet off. All right. So I'm going to get my uh, table here and 
grab a barrier, because remember, I always need a barrier. So I've got supplies. So I'll get a barrier and put that on the table first. I don't want to grab the rest of my supplies yet because I need my barrier. I'm going to get three pillows. Being careful not to hold them against my uniform. And I'll put those on the table. And I'm going to get a privacy blanket. Now, this patient needs to remain covered. I could just keep the sheet on them and they're covered, but I have to get to her legs to be able to put a pillow on, you know, between her legs and I've got to turn her and this sheet is going to get in my way. I could just undo the sheet from the end of the mattress and re uh, make the hospital corners at the end if I wanted to, but I'm just used to using a privacy blanket. So that's what I'll use. Either way is appropriate as long as the patient remains covered. All right, so I'm going to take my privacy blanket. I don't want to shake it or snap it. I just want to unfold it. Can you hold that in place for me? I'm going to pull your sheet down to the end of the bed just to get it out of our way. Microphone issues. Okay. Just to get it out of the way. Okay. All right, Ms. Jones, can I get you to scoot your whole body close to me so you're laying on your back on the side of the bed? Come on over. Good. All right, now I'm going to do the work from here, okay? I'm going to take your furthest arm and put it up over your head like this. I'm going to take the closest arm and cross it over your chest like that. Rearrange this a little bit. I'm going to take the closest knee, bend the knee, and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm going to take the furthest knee and angle it out. Okay. So you can see she's already starting to go in that direction. So it takes no effort on my part at all. Hand on the shoulder, hand on the hip, just to turn her. Okay, now we need some pillows to keep her there. So I'm going to take this pillow. I'm going to put it up next to her back, kind of like a ski slope. See how it's slanted? And I'm going to put this edge of the pillow underneath the patient. I'm going to push down and then forward. I can't just push forward because her body is there. So down and then forward, like an L, like I'm drawing an L. So get the blanket out of my way. So down and then forward underneath the patient. I'm going to take this edge and do the same thing. I'm going to roll it up and then press down and forward. And with scrub tops, sometimes you kind of have to hold the top out of the way when you're tucking. There you go. Okay. See how that forms a roll? That's going to keep her on her side. You feel that support? Okay. Now, you do need to look at your patient to make sure that they're, they look comfortable. And she really does not look comfortable here. So, and I recognize that. So, I'm just going to uncover her legs because I need to put a pillow there. But I'm actually going to bring her legs just a little bit more forward. And that positions her backside back a little bit, puts her in a little better alignment. So I'm going to take a pillow. I'm going to lift her leg and position the pillow between the knees and the ankles. Now I'm going to take this pillow. This one is going to go underneath her arm. Just relax for me. <laughs> this one's going to go underneath that arm. See how that arm drops? That puts a lot of pressure back here. So I'm going to take this pillow, I'm gonna lift her arm and position the pillow underneath that top arm. There we go. And that helps alleviate that pressure. Now the pillow under her head is actually under that bottom shoulder. 
And that's what's causing her to scrunch up like this. So I'm going to lift her head and pull that out. There we go. Position your head. This hand will go underneath that pillow. Feel good? And now we're going to put the call light directly in this hand, the bottom hand. Comfortable? Okay. So now I'm going to cover her back up with a sheet. We always leave our patient looking better than we found them. So I want to make sure the sheet is positioned properly. I'm going to remove the privacy blanket, roll it up in a ball because we don't want trailing edges. And that's going to go right in my dirty linen. Straighten the sheet out. Okay. All right, Ms. Jones, are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine before I go? Which makes no sense, I know, but we're still going to offer it because them's the rules. Um, my environment is clean. My patient is comfortable, safe. They're in the middle of the bed. I'm going to open my curtain. We'll go throw the barrier away. Here we recycle. And now I'm going to go wash my hands. We'll turn the water on, wet our hands, get lots of soap, look at the clock, rub the top to the wrist, the backs of the hands and between the fingers, in between the thumb and index finger, the bottom of the hand by the pinky, and the palm of the hand. And that is 20 seconds. Go down to each one of my nails. Circle the nails on the palm of my hand, and then rinse. Being careful not to touch the inside of the sink or the faucet. Tap, keep the water confined to the sink, and then dry with clean paper towels. Only going to dry what's clean. Once I've dried my hands, we'll throw those away and turn the faucet off with a clean, dry paper towel. Now, I would probably look at my care plan one more time to make sure that I did everything on that care plan. So can you read the care plan to me, please? Either one, somebody. <laughs> Position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. Okay, so she's on her left side. She's got support to keep her there. So my care plan is completed. Now I can tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, stay there for a second. I want to show you guys something. So our skill is over, but I want to show you how much work this back pillow is doing. So just relax for me, okay? When I take this away, watch how much she moves. This is the key to this whole thing working. And this pillow is... A little bit hard to place. It's going to take a little bit of practice. But if you can get somebody in this position, they will sleep like a baby because <laughs> it's, it's very comforting. It's a very comforting position. Thank you. Good? Questions? Anybody have questions? Oh, thank you, Jorge. I appreciate that. You're still showing up even though you're certified. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> you are a super fan. <laughs> I love it. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and take our break. Uh, we're a little bit, it breaks a little bit early today, but I'm doing that on purpose because I've got some other skills to show you, which are going to be longer skills. And we still have to do the state test application. And that takes quite a bit of time at the end as well. So let's take our break just a little bit early today and um, come back at uh, 35 after. Thank you. 
um, which is actually saying the very I just want to Oh, so we're going to go to Like that first 30 minutes, did she just like take our scores and she took the scores for chapter four, right? And then she was just talking about who went through our chapter four. Oh, that was a long chapter. Boy, there's been a lot of homework. And I wasn't doing all of this stuff, these things, until yesterday. I was doing this because I knew we were doing these in class each week. In these, she kind of went over, but there was little things on each page, and I just wasn't paying attention, I guess. And then when we got up to here, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I guess we just get our picture. She said, yeah, we'll get to get a graduation picture. Ten days, she's letting us kind of like go over where we get to register, I guess, so that we can take it in like um, two or three weeks. Uh, I guess we have to, oh, and she's going to go over the background check stuff so we can go to that then somewhere. I think she said it was like 90. Take it to the background check. <sighs>
Yeah. Yeah. But I, but again, I didn't even know that the CNA traveling thing oh, was. I used to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody good? I don't know if I am. <laughs> I have some questions. Yes. I don't know if I should ask them the end or not. Oh, go ahead. It's more like personal. So, for example, uh, like I was telling, I have an 85 years old at home. This is why I'm taking this okay. course. Um, is it correct that if uh, he gets in the hospital, then I can come in like as his caretaker? Because last time he had the surgery, he got some complication. They didn't let me in because they said I'm not a uh, fan. So this, this. Uh... No, it once so. So you're asking that from two different sides, and let me kind of explain how this works, okay? Um, in a hospital setting specifically, they're only going to allow people that they employ work with the patient. So they won't, I mean, you wouldn't be allowed to come in as a caregiver because they already have caregivers that the hospital employs. For a family, now as family member, I, you know, will camp out <laughs> by the patient as family, but I still have to abide by their visiting hours. Like in the position to for them to allow me to come in like a family member or a, care, a personal person. No. Oh, no. It's okay. So that I need to tell him because. So what you need in that case uh, is a power of attorney. Uh, I didn't want to give him that to me, but that's okay. But yeah. <laughs> maybe later. Okay. Then I have another question. For example, I know we need to provide some some um, school background, right? Like a, like a high school uh, some certification or not? What do we need to send when we take the, the test? There, as long as you're 18 or over, you don't need any proof of education for oh, anything. Oh. Oh. Well, I, I do. I, I do have all the way to the master's degree because I have a full-time job. I work from home. But the thing is, it's everything. Some is in French, some is in Spanish, and some is in Portuguese. Nothing is in English. So I was thinking, I have to pay to someone to translate it, so I don't have to do that. No, not for the class and not for the test. Employment, maybe, you know, it depends on where you go. No, I'm not working on it. It's just to take care of him. Okay. Then if you're not using it for employment, no. Yeah, so let's say that um, your gentleman, let's just call him Robert for the sake of simplicity. Okay, so let's say that Robert has an episode, he gets dizzy, he falls, he goes to the hospital. If you are not his family member or not his power of attorney, 
um, you're no different than, you know, anyone on the street as far as the, the hospital is concerned. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to let you, they're, they're not going to give you any special treat. It doesn't matter what certifications you hold. I mean, you could be a doctor, a medical doctor. They're still not going to give you any additional consideration uh, that than they would a neighbor because you're not part of the treatment team employed by the hospital. So in that case, I need a power of attorney. Right, right. If you're not a family member, you need a power of attorney. So even being employed with the hospital, they wouldn't let you be a caregiver to one of your family members? Usually not. Um, it, it really is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And the best way for me to describe it is, you know, when my mom was in the hospital, I'm a registered nurse, I've got a, a varied background, critical care, hospital, all kinds of stuff, right? But in that moment, in that capacity, I can't be both caregiver and daughter. It's just the human emotions just don't let you cross that, that, you know, right. So I'm more likely to miss something because I'm not being objective about it. So it's not in my mom's best interest for me to be her caregiver. It's in my mom's best interest for me to be the emotional support that she needs as a daughter and to allow the caregiving team who has that objectivity to manage the, the medical side of things. Now, I'm because I am a daughter, I am going to make sure that they're washing their hands. And I'm going to bring to their attention things that I think that they're not paying attention to, like, you know, hey, no one's taken her temperature in 12 hours. She's septic. Can we get a temp, please? You know, we really should have temps every four hours when you're septic. Because that tells us a lot about the whether the patient's condition is improving or deteriorating. And I'd rather know sooner than later. So, you know, I'll bring that up. You know, hey, she's septic. No temp in 12 hours. You think we can get a temp? So those types of things, you know, I'm there to kind of be a, a safety net and just make sure that her care is is flipping along the way I need it to. Right. But that's no different than what any daughter can do, yeah. right? It doesn't put me in any different capacity. So it's, you know, when, when you're talking about the treatment team, there really does need to be some objectivity there. I can't be both. Because I get too emotionally wrapped up. I mean, that's my mom. <laughs> that is my mom. So it's in most cases. Now, I will tell you that some states do have a program. I do not believe that we have it in Florida. At least I'm not aware of it. I'll put it that way. There may be one. I'm just not aware of it. But some states do have programs where if you get a certification, if you become a CNA, they will pay you to perform care for a loved one in their home. So some states do have that, you know, within, within the, the confines of the certification that you have. Um, I, like I said, I'm not aware of any of those programs in Florida. And he told you, well, you work from home. Uh, you could uh, apply to be also a caretaker. Because the veterans has this stuff. And they told, well, I don't need the seller because I already have a job that pays me well and all of that. And then he said, yeah, but then uh, when you go to the hospital, if also if you have this uh, uh, CNA, uh, certification then you can come in because last time they didn't let me come because they said are you family related to no I am this heartache. kind of you know and then um but anyways he said well let's go to the military website and let's read it so maybe I could get some extra money to take care of him and then only if he is disabled that he cannot move, cannot eat, so, or if he has some kind of, his brain doesn't 
you know, when you have post-traumatic stress disorder, things that you are in not having medication and, and things like that, it is, then it's like he doesn't even qualify because he is healthy. But when he had that surgery, he something went wrong and they didn't let him come in. They put him, him under for three, four days. And I couldn't mm-hmm. come in to see and the family was calling me, sir, do you know what's going on? I go, I have no idea because they don't let me come in and they all live all far away. So I couldn't do anything. And it Right. It was terrible for me. Now, they, they may have, and, and I don't, I, I will tell you, I am not familiar with the workings of the VA system. So they may have a program for that. I, I, and I, I'm not, like I said, I don't, I don't know of any. It doesn't mean that they don't exist in Florida. I just am not familiar he's with them. In his case, he doesn't because right. Because he's got to have a physical or mental incapacity. Exactly. Yeah. And that makes sense. That makes sense. But. I'm glad to know that that program does exist for those that do qualify Mm -hmm. as far as whether the VA would take you seriously because you have a CNA certification and let you in and give you information. I, that I I can't tell you, I don't know. Um, I I know that in the civilian world, they won't that your CNA certification has no bearing on it because you're not treating him at that much. You're not, operating as a caregiver at that moment because the hospital caregiving team is superseding you. Okay. So your caregiving services are not needed at that moment. Now, if you, if he um, writes up a healthcare surrogate or a power of attorney for healthcare, it doesn't give you any rights to his financial. So when we're talking about power of attorney, there's two different kinds. There's a total power of attorney where you take over everything, financial and otherwise. And then there's a healthcare power of attorney, which means that if he is unable to make decisions for himself, if they've got him sedated and medical decisions need to be made, then you are a designated person allowed to make those medical decisions. And in that case, you would have the right to his information and they would let you in and they would confer with you because you, you have that designation from him. So I would suggest, and I can't give you legal advice. Let me, let me put a big asterisk there, please. I cannot give legal advice. I am not a lawyer. So my suggestion would be to contact an elder law attorney for elder affairs. So I would, I would contact a VA attorney then and find out what the options are. Do you go to the VA with him or his appointments? Most okay. of the time I drive yes him yes there because no. sometimes... If you go with him while he's sitting in the, with the, to see the doctor, tell them, or before he sees the doctor, the nurse will come in, tell them. He has to tell them, I want her on the record. And I've done it three times, plus my husband. The thing is, it's, he doesn't always go to the VA hospital. Well, just, the what do you do if that's what you do? That's, your, that's how they do it. That's all I know. I do know that. If you're sitting there, they will put them in, put you in as, and then we'll give you a piece of paper. You'll be all set. You'll have to sign it. And I know. But you have to go. You can't just do it over the phone. So, just any of his normal VA appointments. The next time he goes to the VA, go with him. And make sure you let them know that you want to be listed as a, a you know, a designated party. And they'll work it out from there. Okay, but that would not work not like if I go to Tampa General, well, he has the surgery. That I don't, that, that I don't know. But that your first step is to get listed with as a, a party with his primary care. That would be your first step. Okay, but he's not my husband or my it doesn't that doesn't matter your relation to him has no bearing on that at all right okay oh that is interesting because he could also go to and ask for an attorney to do his medical power of attorney again so you need to contact you need to talk to a lawyer to explore all of his legal options and let him make that decision since he is of sound mind I can't direct you further than that other than to give you that resource. Talk to his primary care doctor. Let them know what's happening, that you are his primary caregiver. He, the primary care doctor has to know 
Otherwise, everything stops. That is your first point of contact. You need to talk to his primary care provider. Let them know what's happening. And then from that point, you can go to the lawyer and, and explore your options. You're welcome. All right, so let's go to page 118 and let's talk foot care. You guys remember hand and nail care that we learned? Yeah, foot care is hand and nail care, just lower. With the caveat that we don't do anything with nails. With hand care, we clean under the nails and we file the edges. With foot care, we don't do nails. We don't clean them. We don't file them. We don't do anything but look at them. Now, the whole reason for foot care is because feet are usually covered in socks and shoes. They're not very visible. I have no idea what's going on with your feet or your feet or your feet or your feet because they're covered up. I can't see them. So things could be happening that we have no idea about. As we get older, we get less bendy, which means your older individuals may not be able to see the bottom of their feet anymore. They may have no idea. Remember we talked about diminished senses, right? They may have no idea that there is a wound on the bottom of their foot because they don't look at the bottom of their feet because they're not very bendy anymore. The only reason that we're doing foot care, guys, is to look at the feet. We used to tell CNAs, I need you to look at every patient's feet every shift. And the CNAs would do something like this. Oh, my gosh. Like, I don't have enough to do. I've got to look at your feet. I don't know why the nurse wants me to look at your feet. You've got feet. All right. I, what was the big deal? Why did I need to do that? That served zero purpose. That, did, that was not why we wanted you... We didn't want you to verify that they were still there. <laughs> we needed you to look to see if there's any problems with them. Right? So because CNAs wouldn't do what we asked them to do, we created a skill. And that's what foot care is. Foot care is a skill that is going to ask you to soak the foot, wash the foot, rinse the foot, dry the foot, and lotion the foot. Because we figure somewhere in all that, you might actually look at the foot. That is what this skill is all about. Okay, good. Now, if you see something that needs to be addressed, like those toenails are this thick, or they're this long, or there's a red spot, or the foot, it just looks kind of a different color than the other one. I mean, if there's something going on, who do you think you need to let know? The nurse, because the nurse is going to put the patient on a podiatry list. In long-term care, we have a podiatrist, which is a foot doctor, that comes to the facility every month. They only see the patients on the list. You do foot care, see there's a problem, tell the nurse, nurse puts them on the list, the doctor comes and sees the patient. Problem solved. If you're not doing foot care, the problems don't get observed, the nurse doesn't know they're there, the podiatrist comes and goes and never sees the patient. Okay? Make sense? So we don't do anything with toenails, but look at them. So let's look at the care plan for this, because we know the care plan is important. Care plan tells us to provide foot care for one foot using soap and water. How many feet? What if the patient has two? We're still only doing one. We don't care. Not our job. Just tells us to do one. Now for the test, they're going to let you pick. In real life, if it says one foot, they're going to designate which foot. Pay attention to that. Okay. One foot using soap and water. The resident is sitting in a chair and their sock and shoe should be replaced at the end of the skill. Let me explain to you why it says that. In a clinical setting, if you are doing foot care on a real live patient, you're going to put clean socks and shoes on after you put foot care or after you finish foot care. Right? Clean feet deserve clean socks. Makes sense. But for the test, let's go back one. For the test, if you look right here, you'll see this is done on a live testing student. That's you. You may be a patient for foot care. Now, you don't happen to have a clean pair of socks in your back pocket, I'm sure. You have socks with you? 
your socks with you? No? Yeah. So for the test, you're going to clean the foot, but then you're going to put their existing sock and shoe back on them. That's why our care plan tells us to replace the sock and shoe at the end of the scale. They've already addressed this. Are you starting to see that the test is a little bit more put together than you anticipate? Like they've thought of everything. Good? Questions? Step by step tells you exactly how to do this. 30, uh, 32 steps to this skill, but you already know them all. There's nothing new here. Nothing new. You know, let's go back here. You know to follow the care plan to do your opening. We're going to use gloves for this skill. And the reason we're going to use gloves, first of all, their feet. Nobody wants to touch feet. I get it. I understand. But there's a scientific reason we're using gloves. We're doing foot care because we're looking to see if there's a wound. There's a maybe there. We don't know if there's a wound. We can't see the foot yet. So because there's a maybe, we're gonna wear gloves, okay? Um, we're gonna use a barrier, except we're not gonna put the barrier on the table. I don't know about you, but I can't get my foot up on this table. Either can your patients. So we're going to put the barrier on the floor and we'll put our linens and our basin on the floor. And that means that we are going to get on the floor to do this skill. It's okay to kneel on the floor, guys. Is your uniform clean? No. Perfectly okay. But if you want to put an extra barrier down to lean on, go for it. You can do that. It's okay. We know linen rules, right? If we take it and don't use it, we discard it. Linens don't touch your uniform. We know all of our washing rules, whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry, we check the water, they check the water. We know all that. We know to clean the basin. It's just holding water, so we're throwing the sink, rinse, dry, store. We know to do the closing. So th there's nothing new here, guys. It's all stuff we already know. But there are some things that I do want to talk to you about with foot care. So... If you look at the steps of foot care, they're remarkably similar to the steps. You won't have this in your book, but they are remarkably similar to the steps of hand and nail care. So when we did hand and nail care, we supported the wrist and arm at all times. So when we're doing foot care, we'll support the foot. We soak the hand in water. For foot care, we'll soak the foot in water. Looks a whole lot alike so far. We're going to wash, rinse, and dry. Well, guess what? We're going to still wash, rinse, and dry. We're going to put the hand on the towel. Well, here, we're going to put the foot on the towel because we don't want bare feet on the floor. Okay? We're not going to do anything with nails, so that's okay. Um, and we're going to apply lotion last. Here, we're going to apply lotion last, but we don't want the lotion between the toes. The main reason for doing this is to inspect all surfaces of the foot. So that's what makes foot care different from hand and nail care. Hand and nail care, we don't have to say anything about we're looking at the hand, but you do with foot care. You need to say, I'm looking at the foot, or I don't see any red areas or sores, or there's nothing here to report to the nurse. However you want to say it, I don't care, but those evaluators need to know that you know why you're doing this skill. Okay, good. Questions? All right, so let's talk diabetes. Again, this is a fifth grade version of a very complex condition. I'm really going to simplify this for you, okay? So when we have cells in the body, every cell in the body needs a source of fuel to function. Now, we use sugar as a ready source of fuel. And the best source of sugar are carbohydrates. They actually break down in the body into sugar. So when you take in carbohydrates, your body breaks those down into sugar, puts the sugar in the bloodstream. The sugar enters the cells, fuels the cells. Everybody's happy. That is the way every cell in your body works. When your cells get hungry, they tell your brain, hey, I need some fuel. And if there isn't enough fuel on board, your brain will say, we're hungry. Go find some food. The hungrier you get, the more your brain is going to crave carbs. 
okay? And carbs aren't bad. Carbs get a bad rap in our society. They really do. I mean, we are like, carbs are the enemy. No, carbs aren't bad. Carbs are actually very, very good for your body. It's the most efficient fuel source that we have. The problem is not with carbs. The problem is carbs in excess. And our American diet, man, we take carbs and run with it. <laughs> Everything is a carb. So that's really where the problem is. Carbs aren't the problem. Carbs in excess are. So let me explain to you why and how this works. Okay, so when you eat carbs and they break down into sugar in your, your body and that sugar goes into the bloodstream, we need to get the sugar into the cells. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen automatically. Those cells are locked. We actually need a key to unlock the cells for the sugar to go in. And that key is actually made right inside our body by our pancreas. And that key is insulin. Remember I said insulin was a hormone? So our pancreas produces insulin. So when we eat carbs, they break down into sugar, goes into the bloodstream. Your pancreas produces insulin. Those keys go into the bloodstream. Now the key opens a cell, the sugar goes in, everybody's happy. That is a normally functioning system. Good? So when we have diabetes, our body still breaks down carbs into sugar. That sugar still goes into the bloodstream. That part never changes. The cells, unfortunately, though, never get unlocked because insulin is not produced. So we have sugar in the bloodstream and nowhere for it to go. That is diabetes. So if we have sugar in the bloodstream and nowhere for it to go because it can't get into the cells because there's no keys to unlock the cells, that means your cells are always starving. Remember, I told you the hungrier your cells get, the more you crave carbs. That's right. Anybody know a diabetic? What do they crave? Carbs. That's right. That's right. And diabetics are known to have M&M bags under their pillow. <laughs> They'll be snacking all the time. And you're like, don't you know you can't have that? They're responding to a very real problem in their body. Their cells are literally starving. This isn't hypothetical. Their cells are starving and dying. Their brain is trying to keep their body alive. So we're going to get there. So let me explain to you what happens when you have this buildup of sugar in your system. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to get there. Let me lead you there. All right. Is it cold in here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a cell that is starving. We eat carbs. Those carbs break down into sugar. The pancreas produces insulin. The insulin unlocks the door and the sugar goes in. Now our cells are fed and happy and they quiet down and we no longer get that hunger horm or that hunger trigger. Okay. But if we don't have insulin on board, we have a starving cell. We eat carbs. They break down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream, but there's no key. So sugar builds up in the bloodstream, sugar builds up in the bloodstream, but the cell itself continues to starve. It can see the fuel. It can't get to it. It's hungry. Now that cell is going to yell louder and louder and louder and louder because it's kind of like being super, super hungry, smelling pizza and not being able to eat it. Right? You're going to get hangry. Your cells get hangry and they start triggering your brain. And that's where cravings come in. Cravings are absolutely normal for diabetics. I'm gonna tell you how to get around that. But when we have excess sugar built up and we don't have insulin to get that sugar into the cells, the sugar doesn't just disappear. What ends up happening is sugar isn't excreted by the body very easily at all. So that sugar just circulates around and around and around and around and around. Now, if you remember, we talked earlier about gravity on planet Earth. Remember we have gravity? So sugar is a crystal. It's heavy. It's sharp, jagged. Have you guys ever seen a crystal under a microscope? Kind of looks like this. Okay. This is an actual crystal. I grew this with my six-year-old granddaughter. 
fun science experiment. This is what we do in my house <laughs> at grandma's. We do science. So see how sharp and jagged that is, right? I think that's good inside your blood vessels. All this sharp, jagged stuff. Well, it's also heavy. So that means that gravity is going to pu pull these crystals down to the lowest points of your body. Well, what's the lowest point of my lower body? My feet. What's the lowest point of my upper body? Hand and nail care, foot care. Okay. This is why we do hand and nail care, foot care. But what happens to all of those crystals? Okay. They're pulled down to the feet and the hands. Okay. Got it. But what happens? So as these crystals circulate and there's, we don't excrete them. They got to go somewhere, right? They just circulate, circulate. Over time, they're going to get tired and they're just going to kind of rest wherever they end up. And they end up resting inside your arteries for one place. Now, as we, when we're born, when we're young, our arteries look like this. Man, I would kill for these arteries. Mine don't look like this anymore. These are nice, clear, wonderful arteries. Lots of blood can flow through this artery. No problem. But because we eat a lot of carbs and anything that we don't eat, or I'm sorry, anything that we don't use, you know, that we take in any sugar that we don't use, isn't being used by the cells, it usually gets packed up in a storage box for later. So if you are 12 years old and you go to a pizza party and you stuff yourself with pizza, your body's only going to use a certain amount of those carbs and anything that's left, it's going to put in a little storage box and put in a storage unit for later, just in case we need some fuel. Now, those storage units are called fat cells, and that's what your fat cells do. They store glycogen, which is sugar, in a packing box for future use. Now, if you never get to, if you never have a deficit, if you never need that extra, it just stays there. And over a while, it just kind of falls out of fashion. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't really, it's not effective anymore. So now we got fat cells full of boxes of glycogen that we really don't want to use because it's old and outdated and kind of icky and we don't want it. Okay, got it? You guys understand fat? Okay. So after we fill our fat cells up, and there's no more room, that sugar is just going to keep circulating because there's nowhere to put it. We're out of storage units, completely out. So it just circulates and circulates and circulates. And this is how we end up with high blood sugar levels. A lot of sugar in our blood because there's nowhere to put it. Can't get into the cells. And there's no room in the fat cells. Okay, got it? Make sense? So as this sugar circulates and circulates and circulates, it tends to build up on the inside of our arteries. And when it does, this is just a little bit narrower than this. Not much, but a little bit. And in this case, a little bit actually counts a lot. So this person, because the area for blood is narrower, the pressure inside is going to be higher. High blood pressure very common with diabetes because we've reduced the amount of area inside our vessels. Good. Now, how does this happen? Well, remember these, right? Remember these? When this settles on the inside of your arteries, sharp, jagged edges, anything that floats by is going to get all caught up in those sharp, jagged edges. Anything like cholesterol, which looks like pizza cheese in your arteries, it's going to get all caught up in there. It's going to shred cells as they go by. It's going to capture platelets. So you end up with this gooey mess inside of your arteries because the sharp edges catch everything that's traveling by, right? So if we don't pay attention to that and we keep doing what we're doing, we end up with arteries that look more like this. Now, that's a problem because about a quarter of our blood pumping capacity has been reduced.
which means if you get an injury, we're not going to be able to rush as much good blood to the area. So that's going to delay healing. Some of the platelets that we need to stop the bleeding, oh, they're all caught up in this gunk. So we're going to have bleeding issues. Does this sound like any fun to anybody? Okay, long-term effects. Now, about this point, we're told you got to change your ways. A little few, uh, few fewer French fries, a few more salads, get active, right? Because if we're active then and we're pushing the blood through with more force because we're active and our heart's pumping really hard, right? It's going to move some of this stuff out of the way. It's going to help clean the arteries naturally. This is why everybody should have at least 20 minutes of physical activity a day. Keep your arteries clean. Kind of important. But if we don't pay attention and we keep eating those Krispy Kremes because yum, right? We end up with arteries that look like this. Now, you see that red blob in there? That is a blood clot. Because anytime blood slows down or stops, it clots. So now we have a full-blown diabetic that has absolutely no control over their blood sugars. And they're also at risk of blood clots. If they happen in the heart, it's a heart attack. If they happen in the brain, it's a stroke. So does this sound fun to anybody? So insulin, very important. We don't know. Hmm. We don't know. That something like that happened to you? I'm going to talk to you and it's like, um, I was just recently in the hospital because over sugar levels, so it's just... High sugar. Yeah. So a lot of times we don't know that these things are going to happen, right? This is why doctors um, give you advice to help you manage your blood sugars, keep them at a lower level so that we prevent the sugar from building up on the inside of our arteries and capturing all these things and setting off this cascade of all these really bad problems, okay? But the bad problems don't usually announce themselves. They're like not there and then they're there. And a lot of people think, well, that was sudden. Well, no, it actually wasn't. You missed all the warning signs leading up to it. Well, the blood, uh, blood work uh, uh, once a year would kind of let you know where your blood, where your sugar stands. And everything. Well, I can't give you a blanket statement like that because it depends on the patient. Some patients, we need blood work every three weeks. Some patients, we need blood work every three months. Some patients, once a year. It just depends on the patient. We also have a level called an A1C level that tells us over the last three months about what your blood sugars have been running. Okay, have they been running low? Have they been running moderate? Have they been running high? So we have a test to help us see kind of a longer term picture. We do finger pricks to see immediate results. So if I prick a finger and I get a result, that's telling me how much sugar is inside the blood right now at this moment. But it doesn't tell me how you did yesterday. Okay. Now, the problem is that when we have excess sugar in the bloodstream, there's not much we can do about it because it doesn't really excrete very, you can't pee it out. It's like if you take too much vitamin C, no big deal. You'll pee out what you don't need. Sugar isn't like that. When you take in too much sugar, you're not going to pee it out. It's stuck in your body. So that's where it does get. We're going to put as much of it in the, the um, storage units as we can. But anything that if we're out of storage units, it's just going to circulate. Does that make sense? Okay. How about salt? What? The salt. Well, salt isn't going to play a part in this right now. Salt is a different mechanism. Okay. Water follows salt. So that's how we, we don't really excrete salt effectively. We tend to dilute it in the bloodstream with more water, which raises the blood pressure as well. But that doesn't have anything to do with this. Okay. So in health, or 
Let me back up. Let's go back to diabetes for a second. So here's the problem, okay? We have, in America, we have a high rate of type 2 diabetes. Now, there's two types of diabetes. Both of them, essentially, the pancreas isn't working. Pancreas is broken. Now, the two types of diabetes tells us why the pancreas is broken. Type 1 diabetes, that happens at birth or in childhood, and that's just a faulty pancreas from the factory. Like, it doesn't work. Hasn't worked. Isn't going to work. It's just, it's a faulty pancreas. And unfortunately, we haven't gotten to a point yet that we can implant pancreases. Okay, so we're stuck with this. So those patients often have a pump, an insulin pump, that reads their blood sugar continuously and pushes out. So, so we're bringing our keys from an external source. Make sense? Is okay. that the same thing as juvenile diabetes? Juvenile is okay. 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 Yeah. okay. All it means is that our pancreas is faulty. Okay. From the get-go. Doesn't work. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So these, these people are going to have to watch very closely how many carbs they take in. They're going to watch their diet very closely because every carb that they take in, we have to have some insulin on board to help utilize that blood sugar. Good. Questions? Now, type 2 diabetes, a little bit different. And I've got to kind of take you on a journey so you can understand this. Type 2 diabetes is very, very common especially among older individuals in America, and it has everything to do with our diet. But we tend to think short-term, and diabetes is actually a long-term problem. So let me explain to you why somebody develops diabetes when they're 60, and they're like, I don't understand. All I eat is salads. Why do I have diabetes? I don't get this. What doesn't make any sense. So let me explain to you why. So... Let's look at a four-year-old child. Cute little guys. Oh, I love four-year-olds. So inquisitive. I love them. But they get up early. Oh, they get up. I am not a morning person. They get up early. So this four-year-old child wakes up about six o'clock in the morning. Mom's not quite ready to face the day. So mom gets up, lays down on the couch, hands the child a Pop-Tart. Pop-Tart is carbs. They break down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream. Pancreas has to make insulin. Got it? Mom naps for an hour or so, gets up. Child's ready for breakfast at that point. So mommy goes, grabs some cereal. Now children aren't eating all bran, are they? What are they eating? Sugar, 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 sugar. Yeah, Captain Crunch, Fruity Pebbles, Fruit Loops. Those are all carbs. The milk is a carb, a little protein in there, but still carbs. So child eats a cereal, it breaks down into sugar, that sugar goes into the bloodstream, the pancreas has to produce insulin to be used, right? So mid-morning snack, mom's good mom, she gives child fruit, but fruit breaks down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream, what does pancreas have to do? Make insulin. Lunchtime, national chicken nuggets and macaroni cheese toddler diet. Those are carbs. Carbs, I'm sorry, <laughs> chicken nuggets with ketchup. <laughs> yeah. Those are carbs. Carbs break down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream. The, the pancreas has to produce insulin. Then we have an afternoon snack, usually like a cookie, a Miss Debbie snack cake, something like that. Those are all carbs. Carbs break down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream. The pancreas has to produce insulin. Dinner time, buttered spaghetti. Those are carbs. Carbs break down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream. Pancreas has to produce insulin. And then we don't send the child to bed without dessert. So we get something sweet, breaks down into sugar. Sugar goes into the bloodstream and the pancreas has to produce insulin. So. This pancreas has worked super hard all day. This is one day out of that child's life. And yet it sets the tone for how we eat the rest of our life. And we in America tend to eat the favor carb heavy meals. Now, I told you when you get hungry, the hungrier you get, the more you crave 
cards, right? So when we get to be teenagers, we're like watching our weight. So we tend to not eat as much. And then we get ravenous and we go splurge on McDonald's french fries or pizza or that chicken burrito in the freezer, right? And those are all carbs. So we're overloading our system with carbs because our brain is telling us our blood sugar is low, our cells are starving, we need fuel. So starvation diets don't work because they actually are counterproductive. Make sense? Does that help you at all? Okay. So those of you that are still have, that still have young pancreases, work a few salads in. Your 60-year-old self will, will thank you. So sugar is like a drug. You get the addictive periods. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, yeah, the, there is an addictive component to sugar as well. But remember, we're not just talking about sugar. I'm not just talking about the stuff in the sugar canister that you add to your coffee. I'm talking about carbs because sugar hides in places that you wouldn't expect. So we call it the rule of white. <clears throat> if it's white, you should suspect that it's probably a carb. So potatoes and anything made with potatoes. And believe it or not, potato starch is found in a shocking amount of food. The Irish potatoes. <clears throat> Any potatoes? Any potatoes. Any potatoes. 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 Any potatoes. Yes. I heard that sweet potatoes are, are good for you. Well, they are. Potatoes are good for you too, but you've got to... But they're carbs. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to avoid them. What I'm saying is carbs break down into sugar. Mm. Now, your body is able to process sugar just fine, but if we have a diabetic patient, they aren't. So fruits are break down into sugar. sugar. Like sugar Absolutely, they're all made out of the, the fructose. Right. Okay. Yeah, anything that ends in os is a sugar. Sucrose, fructose, lactose, galactose, those are all sugars. Rice. Milk. Milk has sugar, milk has sugar in it. Rice. Every kind of bread. Milk. Yes. Rice. Bread. Pasta. Flour and anything made with flour. And of course, sugar and anything made with sugar. Those are all carbs. And I just described the great American diet. Everything's processed. With Everything is processed. So what, what is the right thing to eat then? Vegetables? A well-balanced meal. But you're looking at it from your point of view, and I want to remind you, that everybody is an individual. Mm -hmm. So everybody's gonna have a different dietary need. So your pancreas is working fine, so a few carbs now and then are fine as long as you're not having excess, okay? But somebody else who has diabetes or maybe has not full-blown diabetes yet, but a difficulty processing carbs because their pancreas isn't working the way it should, mm -hmm. they are going to have a different dietary need. This is what I mean. What a type 2 diabetic person can eat then, because apparently not too many, there are not too many options. So, meals. proteins, mm -hmm. so meats, cheeses, things like that. But cheese has lactose. It does. It has some, but it's lower than flour. So, okay. meat, cheese, Proteins, meat, fish, vegetables, but some vegetables we have to watch because there are some carbs in some vegetables as well. Mm -hmm. So basically meat and salad uh, would be better. Like, Again, cheese. I can't give you specific, you're looking for specifics. I can't give you one answer that is going to cover every oh. type 2 diabetic out there. There is no such thing. This is why we have a dietitian. Dietitian will look at that specific individual and help them plan meals based on their um, specific situation. Do they probably have to exercise too or not? Right. Exercise is important as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. Remember, everybody is an individual. I can't give you one answer that covers everything. 
This is why care plans exist because everybody's a little bit different. Does that make sense? Okay, so we learned that carbs break down into sugar, sugar goes into the bloodstream, but in order to get into the cells, we have to have the pancreas to produce insulin, right? Everybody understands that process. Okay, sometimes we just wear the pancreas out. It just doesn't work much anymore. It's not effective and blood sugar builds up in the system because it can't get into the cells. But other times the pancreas works. It's just making the wrong keys. It's making car keys and we need house keys. This is called insulin resistance. Okay. So what that means is the pancreas is working, but it's not that what it's producing is faulty. It's not able to be used by the body. So we have different medications and treatments for that. Okay. Does that help you at all? Yeah. Okay. So let me extrapolate this out just a little bit. So we've got a diabetic who eats carbs because their brain is telling them, hey, our cells are starting. And that's something that's really hard to overcome. So your brain says our cells are starting, triggers a craving, you go and eat a carb. And that's a very real thing because your cells truly are starting. This isn't that you're trying to go behind the doctor and, and you know, it's, it's not based on your desire. It's based on your cells' ability to live. This is a real impulse. And we need to understand that so we don't shame our diabetic patients. But the problem is they eat that carb. That carb breaks down into sugar. That sugar still can't go into the cells. So all we're doing is adding more sugar to the bloodstream. Not helpful. And it's not going to crave our, our, tame our cravings because our end result was we needed something in the cells and it's still not getting there. So when we have a diabetic patient that craves carbs, it's because their cells are starving and eating more carbs isn't going to help. But they don't understand that. They're not going to get it because right now their cells are starving and that's all they hear. Okay. So as CNAs, we actually can help this because there is a little tiny back door on the back of every cell, little tiny back door, not as effective, but still works. And that door is opened by protein. So if we have a diabetic patient that is craving carbs, try to get them to add a protein to it. So graham crackers and peanut butter, right? Peanut butter is your protein. Opens a little door on the back of the cell. Some sugar can enter the cell. Cell's happy. It's no longer craving carbs. It's able to function. Doesn't do a whole lot for all the sugar in the bloodstream. Because only a little sugar enters. But at least our cells are alive. Okay. Apples and cheese. Half a tuna fish sandwich. Pair protein with the carb. Carb takes care of the mental craving. The protein out allows some sugar to enter the cells so the cells live. Good? Good? Okay. So that's something that we can do to help our diabetic patients. Hey, Lucy, I see you're stuffing M&Ms in your mouth and you're diabetic. How about I give you some cheese? That will help calm those cravings. Okay. Good? Okay. I told you about the havoc that sugar plays in the arteries, right? It coats the inside of the arteries, catches stuff as it floats by. That's not all sugar does though. Sugar also coats the nerves. Now, anybody live up north for any amount of time? I'm a Florida girl, but mm -hmm. you lived up north and you ever had a blizzard, right? Mm -hmm. So power is coming to the pole, but you end up with brownouts, like the power can't go from the pole to your house because that line is covered in ice and you end up with brownouts or you might even lose power for a little while. And that's because the line is not allowing the signal to go through. Make sense? That's what happens to our nerves. Sugar coats the nerves as well, not just the arteries, the nerves as well. So we can have a patient with a thumbtack in the bottom of their foot and their foot knows the thumbtack is there. But it's like, hey, dude, thumbtack hurts, ow. But that ow signal never makes it from the foot to the brain because we are hardwired, not wireless. And that signal has to travel up that nerve to get to the brain so that our brain knows there's a thumbtack there. 
And if that line is corroded with sugar, that signal will never make it. So the foot knows the thumbtack is in there, the brain does not. This is why we do foot care. Now that is a very real scenario. It actually happened to one of my patients. I was a agency nurse, which is a substitute nurse. I went into facilities and I covered when they had their nurses not able to show up for work. So I went in, it was a rehab that I was assigned to, rehab site. And um, I get my assignment, don't know the patients, don't know the coworkers, I'm there to be a nurse. I go into the, the patient's room. And when I walk in the room, all the lights are off except for the small one above the bed. And I gotta do an assessment. Remember, I'm looking head to toe, real problems, potential problems, remember all that, right? So I walk in the room, I flip on the light. Guy starts yelling right away, turn it off, turn it off. Okay, I turn the light off, approach the bed, what's up? Why don't we want the light on? Got a headache or something, what's going on? He says, no, I got diabetic retinopathy and the bright light hurts my eyes, can't handle it. Okay, no problem. So I'm standing there talking to him. And as I'm standing there, I'm catching an odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive. You can pick up a wound at 20 paces. And as I'm standing there, I know we got a wound. So I'm pulling out my report sheet and I'm looking on it. There's absolutely nothing on there about wound care. Uh-oh, I got a new wound, which is even more wonderful. So I tell the guy, hey, Henry, I think you got a wound brewing somewhere. Do you mind if I take a peek? He says, do what you got to do. He's a gruff man in his 50s, ex-military, kind of no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, so I look at all the usual suspects. I looked at the back of the head, the tips of the ears, the shoulder blades, his lower back or coccyx area, the buttocks, the backs of the legs. And I get down to his feet and he's got the slipper socks on. You guys know what I'm talking about? The ones with the dots, yeah. right? So I look at him and I said, um, do you mind if I take your socks off? And he says, no. Okay, well, there's my red flag. Because if he's telling me no, what did he tell the CNAs? No. 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 And nobody reported it to the nurse. So now I'm on a mission. I've got to sweet talk him because you'll always get further with patients by being nice than being nasty. Always. You get nasty, they get defensive. Nothing mm -hmm. gets done. So I turn up the charm. And I'm hard to resist when I'm charming. So I turn up the charm. And I get him to agree to let me take his socks off. And I take the left sock off, no problem. Went to take the right sock off and it was stuck to the bottom of his foot. Found my problem, but I can't get it off. So I go grab a basin of warm salt water, what we call normal saline, warm it up, put his feet, sock it all in the basin, go take care of another patient, come back. Went to take the sock off and as I was pulling on the sock, something went flying past my head. This is a true story, guys. True story. Something went flying past my head. So I look at the floor, and it was floor just like this, the speckled square things. Baseboard's just like that. Now, next to the baseboard is one of these. This is a white painted metal thumbtack. This is not his thumbtack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a white painted metal thumbtack, and it was what was embedded in the bottom of his foot. So this turned into a really bad day. So the problem is that I look at the foot and on the bottom of his foot, an area about this big around was hard black dead tissue. Now, we are good in medicine. We can heal a lot of things. We've come a long way in 500 years, but we can't heal dead. Dead is dead. That's it. And this is dead tissue. So I know this guy's got a really, really, really bad day ahead of him. So I call up the doctor. I call up the family. I call up the wound care specialist. I take my pictures. I document everything. And I leave. Not my patient. Not my facility. But Henry's staying on my mind. It was really tragic because this guy was in his 50s. He was there for rehab. He had had a stroke. And... I knew he had diabetes because he told me he had diabetic retinopathy, right? So I know he's not going to get good blood flow to the area. So healing is going to be pretty, pretty tough. Now, the reason he didn't feel that thumbtack is because 
the diabetes affected his nerves. So about nine months later, give or take, I don't know the exact time frame, but I get assigned back to that facility. But this time I'm on the long-term care side. And I'm looking at my assignment, reading the names of my patients, and there's Henry. Oh, that's not good. He's in his 50s, and he's stuck in a nursing home for the rest of his life. He wasn't able to go home. This is sad. So I go in to see Henry, and I said, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the one that found the wound on your foot. How's it going? I've been thinking a lot about you. And he pulled the sheet back, and he had had to have a below-the-knee amputation. Lost his leg. Now, this is horrible, and it's tragic, and it's doubly horrible because I am now older than he was when this happened. And I can't imagine living the rest of my life in a nursing home. I, that, that's just horrible. So I felt really, really bad for him. There wasn't anything I could do about it, but I felt really bad for him. But this is why we do foot care. Because if a CNA had done foot care and noticed that there was something wrong with the foot way back when it first happened, we might have been able to do something about it. If the CNAs had come to a nurse and said, hey, I went to do foot care and he refused and the nurse went and talked to him, we may have been able to do something about it. And he may have had a whole different outcome. His life changed because a CNA did not do what they were supposed to do. We matter. What we do matters. You may not see it in what you're doing today. You may not ever see it. But by you doing what you're supposed to do, you are preventing a very bad situation from happening to your patients. Okay? What we do matters. So, foot care, pretty easy. All we're going to do is soak the foot, wash the foot, rinse the foot, dry the foot, lotion the foot. But what are we supposed to be doing while we're there? Observing. Looking at the foot, what? observing, bless you. And you've got to say something out loud because the evaluators need to know that you heard this lecture. Okay. Good. Makes sense. Now, I could teach you foot care without going through all that. Would have saved an hour out of my day. Trust me, I want to be at home in my pool drinking my Mai Tai too. But I think that all the patients out there are worth an hour of my time. I also think they're worth you taking this in and applying it. Okay? Good? So let's go over show rules. This is our very, very, very last principle that we have to learn. We're not going to learn it all right now. We're going to learn most of them. And then on Monday, we're going to come back and learn the rest of it. So if the patient's feet hit the floor, we talk about their shoes. Why is that a principle? Why do we care about that? How many of you guys have seen patients or been a patient walking around a facility in slipper socks? How many of you guys? Yeah. And because when we go into the hospital, they give us a gown and those stylish socks, don't they? We put them on because, hey, we're styling. And then we get up out of bed and we walk to the bathroom. And then you come back from the bathroom and you get back into... Yeah. bed with those same socks on. Oh, wait. Is that right? What could be on that floor? Let me introduce you to Mary over here. Mary is here for oh, I don't know. Let's give her an intestinal abscess. Let's give her one of those. And she is on antibiotics for that intestinal abscess. And unfortunately, one of the side effects of antibiotics is that sometimes they give you the runs. And sometimes she doesn't run fast enough to make it to the bathroom, and we end up with stuff on the floor. Now, that's what you just walked through with those slipper socks and then got back into bed with them. Sound fun? No. But that's not the only danger. 
Sure, slipper socks help prevent slips and falls, and they don't even do that all that great because they always spin around and you end up walking on the non-tread side. But let's just say for the sake of argument, they help with slip and falls. They don't help against pathogens. Your patient should not be walking on a floor and get back into bed with those same slipper socks on. They're just, they might as well be laying on the floor from an infection control standpoint. But remember that we have sharp objects in healthcare. This isn't a bank. Okay, bank, there's nothing sharp to worry about falling on the floor. But they got pins and money. <laughs> That's not gonna injure anybody's foot. In fact, please, there's some pins and money on the floor. I'll pick it up for you, right? This isn't a bank. We have sharp objects in healthcare that we use routinely. We have needles, we have lancets, we have scalpels, we have all kinds of sharp, in addition to thumbtacks and staples and other things. Patients may not always see the danger that they're about to walk through. If you wouldn't let a child walk barefoot through that area, don't let your patients walk barefoot through that area. So there's really no excuse here. When our patient's feet hit the floor, they need to have shoes on. Now I know some of you are gonna ask, well, what if they don't have shoes? Oh, they have shoes. They do. They're in a closet. All you gotta do is open the closet. They're in a bag. I mean, I, I can show you where they are. They're in a closet and a bag. Because people go to a facility with shoes on 90% of the time. Now there are a few that show up without shoes. Granted, it does happen, but that is when your nurse needs to know Mary doesn't have shoes because the nurse gets on the phone and calls the facility and says, hey, send us some of Mary's shoes. Or they'll call the family. Hey, Mary needs shoes. Or if the patient is homeless, which does happen from time to time, the nurse can get a hold of the social worker and say, hey, Mary needs shoes. But either way, the CNAs save the day. When the patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. Okay, good. Questions? Slipper socks are not enough, ever, ever. So when we do this skill, we actually have to make sure that we are physically putting the shoe and sock back on the patient before we end the skill. No bare feet on the floor. Okay. Good. Questions? I have a question. Going back to the to the sugar thing. So what the diet the diet uh, sodas and the diet products do actually? Do they help something? The diet products remove sugar and replace it with a non-sugar alternative. They're well, sugar-free. They don't yeah. have any sugar in them. They're but, sweetened with something that is so, not sugar. So they don't build up like the no. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, they're non-sugar. So it actually could prevent diabetes or not? No, not really, because it's a chemical. It's a chemical you're putting in your body. And you have to understand sugar is not bad. Okay, sugar in excess is bad. Your cells need sugar to function. Your cells don't need all the sugar. <laughs> Everything in moderation. Once things get out of whack, once you already have high blood sugar, then we need to look at other strategies. So would the, like a diet candy, would that help with craving or not? It will help satisfy the mental craving, but it doesn't do anything for your cells. Remember, the craving is triggered because your cells are starving. Uh -huh. So you suck on diet candy, it doesn't do anything for your cells. So your cells are still starving, so the cravings will continue. Okay? Remember, the cravings are triggered by cells that are starving. So... What did I tell you that the patient could eat to help sugar enter the cells? Some protein. Protein, right. Right, that's a much better strategy. Okay. 
All right, remember that slipper socks are not enough to protect from injury or pathogens. So let's go through our step-by-step -step, uh, instructions here. We're going to soak the foot in the, uh, in the basin. We'll make sure the basin is on a barrier. We're going to support the foot when we move it. We're going to wash, rinse, and dry between the toes, but we're not going to lotion between the toes. We'll wash, rinse, dry the whole foot. But we'll specifically make sure we're washing, rinsing, and drying between the toes, but don't put any lotion there. Um, lotion holds in moisture between the toes are already warm and dark. Now when you hold in moisture, that's a recipe for athlete's food. Um, we're going to inspect all surfaces. Don't put bare feet on the floor. We'll replace the sock at the end of the scale, making sure we remove the wrinkles. Remember we talked about pressure, right? We don't want wrinkles. And we'll apply and secure the shoe over the sock. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to show you the foot care video. I'm going to show you the video because it's got really good close-ups and I'm not getting on the floor. So can you hit foot care video for me, please? Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Wonderful. I need to do foot care. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close your curtain, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get a barrier and we'll place this on the floor right in front of you and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. We'll place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water for washing. Okay, Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Yes. Is great. it good? Yes, okay. great. Very good. I'm going to set this here. And I'm going to kneel on the barrier and apply my gloves. I'm going to roll up your pants leg and lift your foot so I can remove your sock. We'll place your foot in the basin to soak. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out, making sure that your foot is wet. I'm going to place your foot over here on the towel and apply soap to the washcloth. You want to wash all surfaces of the foot. I'm going to lift your foot up so I can wash the bottom and I'll observe for any red areas, woes, sores, or any other abnormalities. We'll put your foot back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to place your foot on the towel to dry. And I'll ensure all surfaces have been dried thoroughly. I'll take one of the narrow edges and go between your toes to blot. And I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply some lotion. We'll warm the lotion in our hands. 
apply lotion to all surfaces except between the toes. So I'm going to lift your foot and we'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Okay, go ahead and place your foot back on the barrier. And now I can reapply your sock. Put your shoe back on. Can you slide your foot in there for me, please? Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies away now. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. Which, for the test, is just rinse, dry, and store. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the drawer. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get you a magazine while you're waiting? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtain and wash my hands. <laughs> After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right. Any questions? Um, so the two washcloths and the one towel. So the one towel is okay when you put the foot on the towel yeah, and fine. it was dirty it's, to wash it? It's fine. And then you, okay. Yeah, remember it's not really about cleaning the foot, it's not looking. Okay, I just figured since it was going on the yeah. dirty and I, maybe and washing it and then putting it back down and then you rinse the foot in the bucket and then it went back to a different part of the towel, but yeah. It's so fine. Not if, gonna if that's... I'm working with somebody who has some really funky feet, I'll mm -hmm. turn the towel over. Okay. So I'm putting but it in a different area. In case it comes up during my test, I mean, I'm okay with there. They, they don't care. Okay. okay. Yeah, they don't care. As long as the foot is not on the floor. floor. Okay. The bare floor. Okay. That's the only checkpoint here. Oh, oh, that's okay. it. That's it. Okay. That's it. That's the only checkpoint they're worried about. Okay. So they don't really, it has nothing to do with... Mm -hmm. I mean, we're putting, we put the foot, foot in the base of the soap, we take it out, mm -hmm. we wash it, we put it back into rinse. Back in the dirty water. Yeah. Right. Per se, right? Yeah. So right. It, so, it, yeah. you know, if the water, if I put the foot in the base of the soak and mm -hmm. the water is visibly soiled, mm -hmm. I'm going to take, I'm going to take their foot out. I'm going to go change that water because <laughs> that's right. just, so it really depends. If I'm dealing with Martha Mm -hmm. who's been in this facility for the last 14 years and she mm -hmm. already always has shoes and socks on mm -hmm. martha has nothing to worry about right i just didn't know what that person yeah. giving me the test was they don't they don't care okay they're not great the what they're looking at here mm -hmm. the main checkpoint the whole reason you're doing this skill is to look at the foot i'm observing the foot okay they don't care about anything else I and mean, there's nothing on the checklist okay let me show you how many guys have signed up for the online course? Anybody to accept your invitation to the online course? I started it, but I don't think I finished it right. So okay. I'm still in the middle. When you go into the online course, okay. right above the video, this video that I just showed you in the online course, right above it, it actually says checklist. If you click on that, it brings this checklist up. Okay. And you can print it out if you want to. Mm -hmm. But this checklist, let's go to uh, foot care real quick. And let me read this to you so you can see. I'm going to read the actual foot care checkpoints to you. 
that have to do with that. <clears throat> okay, you ready? So we have our, our normal checkpoints. Um, one and two is always the same. One is greet resident, address by name, introduce self. I did that. Two is provide explanations to resident about care before and during care. I did that. So here's our foot care checkpoints. Ready? Place water-filled basin on protective barrier on floor. Use water of safe temperature for soaking foot. Soak resident's foot in basin of water. Use soapy washcloth to wash foot without adding soap directly to basin. I mean, that's what it says here. I'm just reading you the checklist. This is the checklist that they're grading you from. Okay. This is the actual, it's actually made by Prometric. This okay. is their checklist. So let's keep going. Wash top and bottom of foot in between toes. Remove soap from foot, including between toes. Between, between toes. Dry entire top and bottom of foot, including between toes. Warm lotion before applying to foot. Apply lotion to bottom and top of foot, exclu excluding between toes. Remove visible lotion from foot. Apply sock to foot and smooth sock. Replace shoe. Provide support to lower extremity throughout procedure. Avoid placing resident's bare foot directly on floor. Complete skill, having rinse, dried, and stored basin, placing soiled linens in hamper, and disposing of trash. Ask resident about preferences. Use standard precautions. Ask about comfort. Promote resident rights during care and promote resident safety during care. There's nothing on there about the towel. Okay. Or the way I blotted or dried no. between toes. All it says is dry, dry entire top and bottom of foot, including between toes. Okay. So if we was to get here, so a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> into the basin, but we went and got new water. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could even do a correction. I wouldn't have sprayed soap in the water. Oops. Okay. Does that help? Like if you made a mistake, I've noticed on all of these, it does say make any corrections now. They take that into account. Absolutely. Because oh. when you make a correction, you get a check mark. Mm -hmm. The paper doesn't know whether you physically did it or you just said that you corrected it. Paper doesn't know. It's a check mark. Okay. That counts exactly the same. So it doesn't count against you. It doesn't count right. against you. That's why you want to make corrections. Okay. Now, I've got a whole lesson on corrections in the online program. Remember that online program has additional information that I'm not giving you in class. Is there any way to get a printout? I don't have a computer. Okay. Unfortunately, because it's interactive, it's not something I can print out. But you have a lesson in your book on, hold on, I'll tell you. Did you have a cell phone? <coughs> you can watch yeah. it. Oh my goodness. So, hold on. Let me, let me, uh, corrections are page 33. <coughs> so this is about as close as you're going to get to a printout. So this is a lesson, and there's a video on my website. Remember, anytime you see that little video clapboard, that means I have a video on it. Um, but this tells you about corrections and that you can make corrections, how to make corrections, what it means when you make a correction. So I have a whole lesson on that for you. Okay. Good. Yeah, you can, I mean, you'll be effective. This course is effective without doing the online program, but the online, you'll have everything that you need, but the online program just really reinforces a lot of the things that I say, and there's activities in there that get you involved in the learning, so it's not so passive. Okay, that's why I, I do promote the online program for you, because I do, it is effective. I know it's effective. I have literally thousands of students that do nothing more than that online program and pass the test. 
You've got me live in person. How much more effective do you think you're going to be? In fact, I'll go one, one further. I have lots of people that do nothing more than watch my videos and pass. And it's free, probably, or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, we're live streaming. Hello, YouTube world. Right now I have 18, 18 people joining. Monday we had 30, but um, we have a lot of people missing in here too, so it must be like post Halloween. No, <laughs> and there you go. go. There's, There's your link. link. There's your link. Yeah, there we go. There's your link to the online course, right? But we have people that are tuning in right now, and they are not. They are not taking a class anywhere. They are not doing anything more than just watching. Hi, <laughs> we welcome you, um, and they're going to take the test and then they're going to come and let us know that they passed and that will show up on the screen when they let us know that they passed and we'll congratulate them as well. So you guys are, you are three steps ahead of everybody else because you're right here in my class with me in person, but they're getting the same education and they didn't pay for it. How you make money then? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I do as a community service for the patients out there. Okay. I, 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 a lot of what I do, I don't make money on. But I do it because it needs to be done. There's a passion and you can't even imagine. You I'm literally just, cannot imagine. I understand. I don't get paid to take care of friend. I do because he doesn't have family around and... I started as a neighbor, and now I'm living in his house. At right. least I'm not paying rent anymore, which is great for me. Yeah. And good for him. Yeah. I do what I do because I love to do it. I love to teach. Mm -hmm. I love to teach. So I'm actually working on a whole new project. It has nothing to do with CNA, but I'll be giving you the information uh, probably not next week, but the week after. I'm creating a quiz that helps you find your ideal scrub style. Like out of all the scrubs that Cherokee makes, there's like over what, over 200 styles. You take this 15 question quiz and it tells you exactly which style is best for you based on your budget. Isn't that cool? I got so confused for sure when I have to choose one. Sure. I, you walk in the store and it's like there's so many options and it's, it's overwhelming. Wouldn't it be nice just to take a, a quick 15 question quiz and it tells you exactly and then you can go to the scrub shop and say, this is what I want right here. Can you show it to me? Isn't that amazing? Or you can order it right off of Amazon. You can do that too. Then it comes right to your house. No fuss, no muss. Awesome. So that's what we're working on now. So super exciting. Stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to assisting with bedpan. Any other questions before I move on? All right, let's go to page 147. Whoops. The one, whoa, come back here. Come back. The 147. Okay, so you know everything you know to do this skill. You've already learned all the principles. We're going to follow the care plan. Care plan. Every skill starts with the <coughs> opening. Opening. We're going to decide if we need gloves. I'm going to let you know. Yes, you do. You're working with body fluids. We need a barrier. Our patient needs to be in the middle of the bed. We need to clean the basin like we clean everything else. And we're going to do the closing. So there's nothing new here that should be difficult for you to learn. But... We have to talk about the bedpan itself because the most important step for bedpan has nothing to do with the bedpan. And this kind of throws people. If I've got a patient here laying in bed and I've got a bedpan and I put the bedpan underneath the patient, what does that do to their bottom? It yeah, it raises it up. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? Never tried, but I don't think I can do it. Probably not very effective. And if you are effective, it's going to run right up your back and into your hair. Yay. This does not work. Now, if you think peeing uphill is difficult, try pooping uphill. Not going to work. 
So when we put a bedpan under the patient, the most important step is to get them into a normal elimination position. You've got to put the head of the bed up. This is the most important step for this skill. Otherwise, the rest of it means nothing. They're not going to be able to go. But now they're sitting on that bedpan, pushing it down into the mattress. You're not going to be able to pull it out from under that butt. You've got to put the head of the bed back down to pull the bedpan out. So with all of that up and down of the head of the bed, whatever's in here is going to slosh. What could we put on the bed that might protect the sheets that's waterproof and absorbent? There you go. Sure, a chucks, yeah. So we're gonna put a chucks under the patient. We're gonna put the bedpan on top of the chucks under the patient and put the head of the bed up. We're gonna give them toilet paper and a call light and let them go. You don't wanna be there for that. They don't want you there for that. You wanna step on the other side of the curtain for the test because you have nowhere else to go. But in a clinical setting, don't stand there. People don't go with an audience. You need to wash your hands and leave. When they hit the call light, you'll go back in and remove the bedpan. People need privacy. But here's the problem. This is a very, very hard skill for patients. And that's because you've been taught from the time you were this tall, don't pee in the bed. Don't pee in the bed. Don't pee in the bed. And certainly don't poop in the bed. So your brain knows that you are in bed. And your brain's going to go like, whoa, this is not the right place. Okay? This is not what we're supposed to do. So patients with bedpans often have a tremendous amount of difficulty actually going. You need to be patient and understand that. You might put a bedpan under a patient, come back 20 minutes later, Nothing happened, take the bedpan out and try again in a little bit. But you need to be patient with them. It may take two, three, four times of being on the bedpan before they're successful. It's because their brain isn't letting them go. On top of that, there's not a tremendous amount of privacy. They've got a curtain separating them from a roommate. Every noise they make is going to be, it's going to be heard. That's embarrassing. People are sensitive to odors. That's embarrassing. So we need to understand this is not an easy skill for patients, and we need to be patient with them. Sometimes maybe a little odor prevention might be a good idea. Spray the room before. Okay. Turn the water on in the faucet. That helps with the urinary letdown reflex, but it also masks sound as well. So there's some things we can do to help our patients, okay? Let's take a look at this care plan. Care plan says the resident has requested a bedpan. The resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. The resident is able to move as directed. Let me explain to you why this care plan says what it says. Let's go back a page. If you look down here, remember this is testing information. You guys remember that? If you look down here, who is the patient for this skill? That's you. You may find yourself on a bedpan for the state exam, but you are going to remain fully clothed. Let me say that again. You will remain fully clothed. This is a simulation skill. You're not peeing anywhere. You will remain fully clothed. They're going to put a hospital gown on <laughs> over your clothing and put you in bed. This sentence, this sentence exists for the test only. The resident is not wearing undergarments. They don't want somebody to try to pull your clothes off during the test. It says the resident is able to wipe self. They don't want anyone in your no-no square during the test. Okay? Good? So if you get this skill for the state exam, your person is going to be fully clothed, but you're going to pretend otherwise. You're not going to be cleaning them. Make sense? If you go anywhere near any of that, the evaluators are going to stop you. Wouldn't it be better to go with them <laughs> using the mannequin? No, because the mannequin does not stay on the bedpan. Okay. 
But it's also, if you remember, we talked about this last week, it's also important that you experience these skills from the patient's point of view. This is why I'm going on the bed. I That's wanna, right. I it is important that you experience this from the patient's point of view, which is why this is still a live person skill. Okay, good. Questions? All right, let me explain to you how we decide to use a bedpan. It's not the way you think. So if I've got a patient in a, a clinical setting and i got to figure out my care plan, how we're going to take care of things, <laughs> toileting is always number one on the list. Always, 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 because I know my patient is going to have to go at some point during my shift. It is the one constant. Okay, toileting is always number one. So the first question I'm going to ask is, is my patient continent? Are they able to control it all by themselves? And if the answer is yes, Yay. <laughs> if the answer is no, then I'm just going to put on the care plan. We're going to clean them up every two hours around the clock. Easy. Done. Okay. But if they're continent, I've got a whole pathway I have to go down. First question I'm going to ask is, can they make it to and from the bathroom by themselves? Do I really have to be involved in this? If they can make it to and from the bathroom by themselves, the care plan is going to say bathroom privileges. That means they go by themselves. I'm not involved. You guys all have bathroom privileges. You get up and go when you need to. I am not involved. Thank you. Okay. But what if they can't make it to and from by themselves or they need some help? That would say bathroom with assist. They're still going to the bathroom, but we're going to help them out with whatever they need. Okay. Now, if they can't get to the bathroom, but they're still continent, we have a portable toilet called a Bedside commode, you can see it right over there beside the sink. We bring it right over next to the bed. And the care plan would say bedside commode. Now, it'll either say bedside commode ad lib, which means patient uses it anytime they want to. We're not involved other than cleaning it. Or it may say bathroom commode with assist, which means we help them out with whatever they need. Okay. So, those are the ideal situations. They get to the bathroom or they use a bedside mode. This bedside mode works kind of like a toilet, same position. They're not in bed. It helps. Good questions. All right. So now if I go through that whole list and the answer is no, 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 no. They can't get to the bathroom even with assist. They can't use a bedside mode even with assist. Uh-oh. Now I only have two options left. One of them is a catheter. And I can only use a catheter if the pee can't come out by itself. Bless you. I can't use a catheter for convenience. We used to. Oh, man. Used to. 30 years ago, you went into the ER. You got a catheter for a splinter. I didn't care what was going on with you. You got a catheter because I wasn't going to deal with your toileting issues. Right? Catheters all around for everybody. But we realized that that wasn't safe or healthy for our patients because catheters have a high rate of infection. We weren't doing our patients any favors. So now the only time we can use catheters is if the pee can't come out by itself or if it's going to come out at a really inopportune time, like during surgery. Okay, good. Make sense? Question. Is that a doctor's order or is that a nurse's? That is a doctor's order. Okay. Yeah. Nurses uh, can't decide to use a catheter. We, we can decide that, yeah, a catheter is indicated when calling it the order, okay. but we do have to have an order. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So catheters used very rarely. So the only thing I'm left with is bedpan. Did you guys notice that is way last on the list? It's last on the list for a reason. Patients have problems using bedpans. Okay, good. We're going to try everything else we can before we get there. But if we're there, if we have to use the bedpan, then we need to use it right. Questions? Okay, do you remember learning on Monday, clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away? You guys remember learning that? Yeah. Okay, so when we have a bedpan, i got to get a chucks underneath my patient. So I'm going to take the chucks, hold it up lengthwise. Okay. 
Here's my chucks. I'm going to hold it up lengthwise with the absorbent side facing me. And I'm going to roll it toward me because it's clean. Roll it toward me. And then I'm going to ask my patient to lift their hips. I'm going to lay it on the bed. And I'm just going to unroll it underneath them. And they put their hips down. Okay. It's the easiest way to get a chucks under a patient. Questions? Okay. When I'm putting the chucks under the patient, remember our care plan says that they don't have on any undergarments, which means I'm contacting a bare butt. Do I want gloves oh, on? Yes. Yeah, because butt juice. Okay. So I'm going to put my gloves on. I'm going to put the chucks on the bed, and I'll put the bedpan on top of the chucks. But I just told you the most important step of bedpan is putting the head of the bed up after we get the bedpan on the bed. But I have butt juice covered gloves on. Do I want to touch that bed controller with butt juice covered gloves? No. What do you guys think? No. 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 Let's take your gloves off. So what am I going to do? Take your gloves off. Take my gloves off to put the head of the bed up. Good. Give the patient call light, give them some toilet paper, exit stage left, let them do what they're going to do, which for the test, we're just stepping on the other side of the curtain. And when they're done, they're going to tell us, I'm done. We're going to come back in and put the head of the bed back down, put new gloves on to take that bed pan out and empty it. So you don't need to use the, the blanket to cover the patient? Sure. Our patient is uncovered or undressed for this skill. You can leave the sheet on them, but I'm telling you that sheet is going to get stuff on it. Oh, Caroline, awesome. I passed, thanks to you guys. Thanks so much. Congratulations. Good job, I'm so proud. Um, so yeah, you can leave the sheet on them, but it's going to get soiled because things splash. Okay, so it's best to, pull, to put the privacy blanket on and pull the sheet down. So yes, this will require a privacy blanket for this skill. Okay. Myla says, thank you. Yep, that's me. I'm thinking of taking a course, but have it yet. Oh, and <laughs> since you're talking about somebody that's uh, just joining us. So I'm so glad that you joined us. Good luck. And uh, whatever we can do to help, let us know. All right, so we have... A chucks on the bed, we have a bedpan on top of the chucks, we have the head of the bed up, they went, we put the head of the bed back down, and we took the chucks and the bedpan out. When I take the chucks and the bedpan out, I don't want to carry an open bedpan through the room. That's a privacy issue, nobody needs to see what's in there, but it's also an infection control issue, because what if I trip over my shoelaces? If I've got a bedpan full of urine and I trip, I'm gonna end up in the bedpan. So we wanna make sure that bedpan is covered. So when we take the bedpan out, we take the chucks out at the same time, and we cover the bedpan with the chucks. And that keeps whatever's in there private, but it also helps with infection control. Okay? It's okay to wear a mask, like, so you don't have to... So masks don't help with odor. What the hell is odor? Uh, if you use a little Vaseline in your um, nose, just put a uh, uh, Vicks, I'm sorry, Vicks, put a little Vicks right here at the bottom of your nose. That will help with odor. I can't do that because the, the menthol, actually, I have very sensitive skin. I'll look like Rudolph in like two seconds. So I get Vaseline and I put a couple of drops of um, essential oils. So like I, I like lemongrass and orange blossom, those are my two favorites. And I'll just put a little bit of um, the essential oils and the Vaseline and I'll use that. It does help cut odor. It's not gonna eliminate it, but it does help cut the odor. If you breathe through your mouth, it, help. it helps me. It does help, yeah, yeah, it does help. Yeah. This is a bedpan. If it looks like a toilet seat, it's where the butt goes. Makes sense. Imagine perching on that. Not gonna be comfortable for anybody. So when we have the, the bedpan, we slide it underneath the patient so the widest part of the bedpan is under the bottom. Okay. Good? Questions? Okay. 
P comes out under pressure. P under pressure is going to hit this flat plastic surface. And I want you to remember the undercarriage is right here. That's not very far. It's a flat, flat plastic surface. You're going to get splashed back which means your patient's undercarriage is gonna be all wet. No, it's just physics, right? So there's two things that you can ask the nurse that are gonna make your job so much easier. You're not gonna use these for the test, but in a clinical setting, they will save you. First thing you wanna ask the nurse is, can I use toilet paper? The second thing is, can I use powder? So toilet paper and powder. If you take this bedpan and you loop up toilet paper, big loops, five or six big loops, and you lay it down in the middle of the bedpan, it helps absorb the urine as it's coming out. You don't get splashed back. Your patient remains dry. They will love you. If you have a bare butt sitting on plastic, remember our bodies are 98.6 degrees. That's hot. If you ever sat on a leather car seat in summer, you're going to stick. So when you try to pull this out, remember it's full of liquid. You try to pull this out and it's stuck to the butt, that liquid's going everywhere. So you ask the nurse if you can put powder on it. If we can put powder on here, it slides under the patient, but even more importantly, it slides out very easily. Okay, little tricks. Good? Questions, but you gotta ask. And I'm gonna use that for the test. So, um, okay, you have a man there. And he's going to pee. And Men urinate. urinate in urinals. They look like milk jugs. Ah, okay. Bed pants are okay. used for. I don't have to finish my question. I yeah, bed pants are used for urination on females and bowel movements for both. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. This is full of pretend pee. Remember, there's not going to be anything in it for the test. The patient's not really peeing. But where do you think pretend pee needs to go? The toilet. In the toilet, that's right. Even though it's pretend, it's still pee. Pretend pee, but it's still pee. It goes in the toilet. Okay. Now, your patient wiped themselves. We know that because care plan said that they could. So at the end of the skill, if we know the patient wiped themselves, what do you think they need to do? Go ahead. Wash their hands. Wash your hands. That's right. So at the end of the, the skill, before you leave, you need to give them some sort of a hand wipe, a washcloth, a something before they pick up that tuna salad sandwich for lunch and eat it with a side of E. coli. Now, I'm going to tell you that patients using bedpans are usually not able to get themselves very clean because there's just not a whole lot of space to work with here. The test tells us that they can wipe themselves, but in a clinical setting, chances are you're going to be helping with that task because there's just not a whole lot of room there. But for the test, we're going to take the gift that they give us. The patient is able to move as directed, so we can ask them to lift their hips, slide the bedpan under, slide the bedpan out. In a clinical setting, if we're going to have to help with cleaning, we don't want them to lift their hips. We want them to roll onto their side, hold that bed hand down so it doesn't go anywhere. And then while they're on their side, we can wipe and clean and put the cleaning items in the bed pan before we take it away. Okay? Good. And hold that, like you said, roll them and hold that. Because it will. You're gonna oh, yeah, you're it'll gonna tell. Hold that change. <laughs> it'll and tell, yeah. yeah. Because they're sitting on here. When they roll, the they're, they're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, it'll spill everywhere. Now you're doing a full lemon change yeah. and a partial bed bath and all of that. So in a clinical setting, usually acute care clinical settings like hospitals and rehabs, you'll see this little contraption here. It looks like a shower head. It folds out over the toilet, sprays directly in the toilet. That is a bedpan cleaner. However, it is water under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface, you will get splash back. So if you're using a bedpan cleaner, you got to dress for the occasion. You don't want any of that stuff in your holes. So we're going to cover with mask and shield. Remember, mask does not really help with odor, but it is going to help keep biological material from getting into any of your holes. You probably also want to cover your clothing with one of those isolation gowns 
to help prevent fecal matter from being deposited on your clothing where you can take it home with you at the end of the day. We don't want bonuses at home. Okay. Good. Good. When we position the bedpan, you got to make sure it's far enough back that it's going to stay in that position when you put the head of the bed up. Remember that the head of the bed is going to bend right where that bedpan is. So when you put the bedpan under and lift them up, they may have to adjust that bedpan a little bit one way or another, just because that's right where the crease is, right? That's where the patient bends. All right, so let's look at this care plan one more time. The resident has requested a bedpan. The resident is not wearing undergarments and can wipe themselves. And the resident is able to move his record. Okay, so here are our checkpoints that we want to pay attention to. We're going to ask our patient to lift their hips, or you can ask them to roll either way. Put the chucks under the hips, position the bedpan under the patient, raise the head of the bed, give them TP and call light. Lower the head of the bed when they're done. Put your gloves on, remove your bedpan or chucks. Cover bedpan with chucks for transport. Clean and sort as usual, and give the patient a hand light. That's it. That is the skill. Now, if you look at, what was it? Hold on. If you look here, you'll see that somebody with your level of experience should be able to perform this skill in 10 minutes or less. It doesn't take that long. It really doesn't. Um, I do this whole skill in like four minutes. So they give you plenty of time to do this. Don't rush this. Don't rush it. Can you play the video for me? My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I understand you need a bedpan. Can I assist you with that? Sure. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll need a chucks and a privacy blanket for this skill. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this privacy blanket over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy as we do this skill. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to spread this out without snapping it or shaking it. And I'll have you hold this in place so I can pull your sheet down. That way your sheet remains clean as we do this skill. Okay, I'm gonna prepare a chucks to place under you before we put the bed pan in place. I'm gonna hold the chucks up lengthwise and roll it toward me. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. and I'll just place this on the bed. I'm going to open the drawer that the bed pan is in and get a set of gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to bend your knees, lift your hips as high off the bed as you can, and I'm gonna unroll the chucks underneath you, okay? Okay. All right, go ahead and bend your knees and lift up. Okay, and you can relax. I'm gonna go around to the other side of the bed and unroll it. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you lift up again, please? I'll smooth the chucks out, making sure it's positioned properly on the bed. You can relax. Okay, now I'll get the bed pan out up in the drawer. And I'm gonna place this under your bottom, if I can get you to lift and relax. Is that comfortable? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up, but let me remove my gloves first. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna put the head of the bed up. Please tell me when you're comfortable. Okay. And you may have to adjust that bed pan a little bit as it moves. Tell me when you're comfortable. That's good. Okay, here's your toilet paper 
and your call light. And I'm just going to wait out here. Please let me know when you're done. Okay, Mr. Jones, I understand you're finished. Let me help you with that. I'm going to put the head of the bed down now. And please do not lift your hips. Once the head of the bed is in the lowered position, I'll put on a pair of gloves. And I'm going to hold that bed pan flat as you lift off of it. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to take the corner of the chucks and hold the bed pan flat as you lift off of it. You can go ahead and lift on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I'll remove both the bed pan and the chucks and take them to the bathroom for disposal. I'll be right back. Once I get over here to the bathroom, I'm going to unwrap the bed pan and we'll throw the chucks away. I'm going to empty the contents of the bed pan into the toilet and then I'll rinse the bed pan. We'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. And then we'll set the bed pan down to dry. I'll pick it up with a paper towel. I'm going to dry the inside. We'll throw that paper towel away. I'll dry the outside, throw that paper towel away, and get one for the drawer. Okay, I'm going to place the bed pan in the drawer along with the toilet paper and we'll use the paper towel to close the drawer. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, would you like to wipe your hands? Thank you. Okay, you can relax your legs if you'd like. And I'm going to pull your sheet up and remove the privacy blanket. We want to make sure that we roll the blanket in a ball so that any trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to go put this in dirty linen. I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. A magazine, perhaps? You. Your call light is there. Please let me know if there's anything that we can do. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions? Sorry, I always have questions. So if it was the number two, how you clean that thing? Do you have a brush or something? Again, if you have toilet paper in there, you know, if you put toilet paper in the bed pan before, it tends to slide right out. So I would suggest putting toilet paper in the bed pan. Mm, not put paper towels in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't put paper no. towels because paper towels oh, will yeah. clog up the yeah. toilet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I see that, that, that you didn't throw it on the toilet, which all the, on that stuff. Right, that's like It was only for the video, right? I'm not sure what's like. Okay. Um, in a clinical setting, you're going to dump it in the toilet. Here, for video purposes, you do that. Okay. I use it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's just for video purposes. So after you do the first pair of gloves, like when we're in the exam, do we go and wash our hands? You don't have to because it's the same patient cooties. Okay. Yeah. Same cooties, don't have to wash your hands in between. Okay. Different cooties, you gotta wash your hands in between. <laughs> that's the best way to, to describe it, to explain mm -hmm. it. Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. If there if you have a patient on the bed pan. Yep. And you can leave to yep. let them do their business. If they haven't called you within, how long do you wait? I would say no more than fifteen minutes. Okay, that that's kind of my cutoff. Okay, if I if they're super frail and they've got super um, delicate skin, it's going to be five Sooner. minutes. Okay, yeah, it really depends on the patient themselves. Okay, but um, no more than fifteen. Okay, no more than fifteen. I actually had a CNA that left a patient on a bedpan 
for over four hours. It cut into their skin. Yeah, they had a horrible pressure sore that took literally months to heal over. It was horrible. Don't leave them on a bedpan for four. And I asked, did you forget about the, what, what happened? She says, no, I just got busy and I really didn't think about it. No, this person's gonna have to pay months of a price because you didn't think about what we do matters. So, I don't, you, you know, if you need to set an alarm on a phone, then set an alarm on a phone. But, you know, do something to remind yourself that the other issue is why did it take you four hours to go back and check on that person? I mean, you should be checking on your patients at least every hour just to make sure that they're still breathing. You know, we got a, a bigger responsibility. So four hours, don't do that. All right, go to page 76. I'm going to try to get through this really, really quickly because we still have to do uh, registration for the state exam. Good and, yeah, and congratulate. we got a lot to do. <laughs> so let's go to page 76. Again, you already know the steps to this. You know to follow the, we're going to do the opening. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. We're going to do specific steps for the skill, and we're going to do the closing. So nothing new here. Um, this is actually a super short skill. If you look down here, it'll tell you that somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in four minutes or less. Okay, so super, super short. These are the shortest skills we have for the test. But let me explain to you what this is. So our care plan at top page 77 tells us, Provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's left shoulder. Flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. Provide three repetitions in each exercise, and the resident is not able to help with the exercises. So in order to understand what we're doing here, how to do this skill, we kind of have to understand what range of motion is and what it isn't. Probably more important that I explain what it isn't. Okay. So as CNAs, we do exercises on patients, but we don't do them for the reason you think we do, okay? We tend to think that we do exercises to make people better, right? They're in healthcare, that's, you know, that's kind of the mindset. We do exercises to make people better, but that's actually not why we do exercises with patients. We have a whole department geared toward exercises to make people better. What is that department? Anybody know? Physical therapy. Physical therapy. And to be a physical therapist, it is a doctorate degree. 10 to 12 years. How long are we here? Four weeks. Four weeks. Can't be us. Nope. Physical therapy assistance is a two-year degree program. How long are we here? Four weeks. Four weeks. Can't be us. We do not do exercises to make people better. Not us. Physical therapy does exercises to regain function, make people better. CNAs do exercises to retain function or keep what we got. We're just trying to keep them from going backwards during other treatment. So you need to get in your mind the reason that we're doing this. It's not to make people better. So that means that we are not the no pain, no gain gang. That's not us, right? PT can say that that's not us. So if we're doing exercises and we lift the arm to here and the patient winces or grimaces or says, ow, we're going to come back down to start. And the next one will go below the ow. And then we're going to go find a nurse and say, hey, I got to hear and got ow. Go figure it out. Not my job. Okay. So we go below the level of pain. We are just trying to maintain what they've got, not make it any better. Make sense? So we need to be watching our patients for signs of pain, like grimacing or wincing or stiffening up or resisting or saying, ow. And we want to respond to that. Make sense? Good. All right. Three exercises that CNAs get to do. That's it. That's all we do. Three exercises. That's it. We do flexion extension, which is up down. Everybody extend your left arm above your head like you're asking a question. Extend that arm up. Way up. Straight. Get that elbow straight. 
All right, bring it back down. Let's do it one more time. All the way up, all the way up straight. Bring it back down. Let's do one more time. All the way up and come back down. You guys just did flexion extension. I told you to extend your hand above your head. That's extension. The opposite of that is flexion. Bring it back down. Two halves, same exercise. Okay, got it? All right. So you also notice I told you a familiar action that explained how to do this. Like you're asking a question. <laughs> you don't know what flexion extension is. You know who else doesn't know what flexion extension is? Patience. Your patients. So you've got to use terms they understand. I am going to extend your arm above your head like you're asking a question. Your patient hears that and they go, oh, I know how to do that. I can do that. That doesn't hurt. I can do that. They will cooperate. If you just grab their hand and start moving it, they will resist because they don't know if what you're about to do hurts. You've got to put it in terms they understand. Good? Abduction, adduction. If you abduct a child, you take it away from its family. Don't do that. That's bad. But we can abduct extremities. We can take our extremity away from its family. This is a side to side motion. Now I want, I want you to pay attention to something here. When I had you do flexion extension, watch where my hand ends up, right? Flexion extension was up, see where my hand is? And back down. Abduction, adduction is up, see where my hand is? And back down. My hand is in the same place for both exercises. Why do we have to do two exercises? Because this works different muscles than this. Okay? Even though the hand ends up in the same place, it's a different muscle action to get it there. Good? And then we have rotation, which is simply around. So these two are pairs. Extending is up, flexing is down for our shoulder. Abduction, adduction, abducting is away, adduction is adding it back in. Two halves of the same exercise. Rotation is only one because it's just a full around. But rotation of a shoulder is not what you think it is. People seem to think rotation is a pitcher windup. You know, something like this. I don't think my arm. Pitcher windup. It's actually not. If you hold your hand out, palm up to the side. And then you roll your arm all the way over so it's palm up, upside down. Feel what that does inside your shoulder. Come back around. Do that a couple times and feel what that does inside your shoulder. That is rotation of a ball joint. Not this. Okay. Good. Okay, so how do we know what exercises to do with our patient? The care plan. Correct. So this care plan, let's go back. This care plan tells us to perform range of motion exercises to the resident's left shoulder, flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. So those are the two we're doing. So up, down, side to side. How many repetitions? Three. 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 So we're going to do each one three times. We're going to tell our patient what we're doing. But most importantly, we're going to lift from below so we provide support. Make sure you lift at both joints, by the way elbow and wrist. We're going to return to start for every repetition. Always return to start. You want to support at two joints and we want to monitor for pain. Those are what we're going to, those are the steps for this particular skill. Good? Good? All right. We have a volunteer. Somebody come lay down in this bed for me. Is off. Testing one, two. Okay, you guys can hear me now. All right, we're going to do it manual. <laughs> Okay, so do you guys remember on the care plan which body part I'm supposed to be exercising? The left. Remember that my left and her left are different if I'm facing her. Keep that in mind. Now, this is my second skill that I'm demonstrating for you. 
the evaluator is going to tell you before your second skill, you can simulate hand washing. Simulate just means say. So I'm going to do the skill simulating hand washing so you can see how that works. Here we go. Good morning, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your left arm. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands real quick and I'll be right back. I am washing my hands now. I have clean hands now. I would wash my hands here. Any of those will work. Okay. All right, Ms. Jones, I'm going to do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is lift your arm above your head and then back down to the bed like you're asking a question, okay? So I'm going to support at the elbow and the wrist, and we're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. Feel any pain? Okay, we're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. Still okay? One more. We're going to go all the way up and all the way back down. Good. Now I'm going to bring your arm out to the side and back in like you're making a snow angel. Okay, so I'm going to support at both joints. And we're <laughs> Oops, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> We're going to go all the way out and back in. There's one. Feel okay? All the way up and back in. That's two. One more. All the way up and back in. That's three. Good? Any pain or discomfort? Are you comfortable? Can I get you a magazine before I go? Environment is clean. Now, I believe you're laying on your call light, so let me just pull this out. There we go. There's your call light. If you need anything at all, just press that red button and I'll come in, okay? I'm going to open the curtain. I am washing my hands now. Think about the steps of my skill. I'm probably going to read that care plan one more time, make sure that I did everything properly, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Good? Questions? All right. I know of your specific challenges. I'm going to work with you directly. So feel free to tune out for the next few minutes. Would it be okay? Could we do this on um, Monday? Monday, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank but you. I will work with you specifically. I greatly appreciate you. Okay. <laughs> this is your review sheet for today. I'm going to leave that here. You can grab one on your way out. So the first thing that I'm going to pass out to you is this. This is your instruction sheet, okay, for the, the state exam. This is your instruction sheet. We're going to go through it step by step. Don't panic, okay? Just let me pass this out first. Then I'm going to pass the um, registration packet. The packet is seven pages. We're going to get through it. It's okay. <laughs> All right, the packet is seven pages, but let me pass the instructions out first. No, that's okay, I got it. Okay, those of you tuning in from home, you can, um, I'm going to give, excuse me, give you the website to go to in a few minutes, but this sheet, oh, hold on, sorry guys, <laughs> sorry YouTube world, let me turn you back around, I can't wait to get the one that follows me, okay. Um, I'm going to show you this on the screen in just a minute. You can take a screenshot of it. Now I'm going to pass out the actual registration forms. They're printed backwards, set page seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You're going to have to put them in the right order. Okay. I didn't have time. I'm running late. Sorry. Please do not work ahead. 
If you put the wrong thing in the wrong place, it will affect your ability to test. So you need to stay with me. Super important. Go ahead and collate it into the right order, please, when I give you your packet. And those of you from my class, when you come into class, those of you who are not here, who are tuning in remote from my class, when you come into class on Monday, these are going to be here on the table. Make sure you get your registration packets. All right. So I made this super easy for you guys. I mean, super, super easy. I have given you the paper registration packet. You can fill that out and mail it in. That is a slow boat to China. Add three weeks on to your testing if you do that. If you register online, it's way faster. Now, I have test registrations for you, or registration instructions. If you go to foryourcna.com, that's my main website. Under testing, I have test registration instructions. I literally did an entire test registration on the screen and videotaped it. So you get to see exactly how I did it from beginning to end. But that's going to go kind of fast for you. And it's going to be hard for you to keep up. Below that, scroll down a little bit. Below that, I have a slide-based presentation with all of the screenshots. So watch it on the video first so you know what, what to expect. Then go to the slide-based presentation and follow along with what you see on the screen. Because that way you can control the timing. Sound good? Okay. So I have uh, all the registration instructions right there. I made it super easy for you. But let's go through the timeline. You guys see this right here? What does that say? You have to register as an E3 challenger. What are you registering as? E3 challenger. One more time. If you check any other box than E3 challenger, they're not going to let you test. And then you're going to call me and you're going to say, I, they're not letting me test. I don't know why. And I'm not going to be able to help you because you have to register under E3 challenger. What are we registering under? All right, I'm going over that a million times because every single class I have somebody who doesn't follow instructions and <laughs> registers under something else, and then it, it's a nightmare to try to sort out, okay? It's going to add six to eight weeks to your testing timeline. It is a nightmare. So please make sure you pay attention to this. So let me explain to you the registration uh, process. There's four steps. First step is you need background check. Has to be a level two photo enabled background check. Level two photo enabled for medical. You have a background check for childcare, doesn't, doesn't count. You have a background check to work in the school system, doesn't count. You have a background check for concealed weapon, does not count. Has to be for medical. If you don't have one, if you're not 100% sure that yours is gonna work, go get a background check. Right here in the first column, You'll see a blue link there for Deontis. That is uh, the closest one for us. They do a level two photo enabled background check at the UPS store on Barclay. You can't just walk in and have it done. You have to register first. Use that link to register. You can get same day appointments, but you have to register through the link. Okay, good. When you register for your background check, they're going to ask you for an ORI code. You see this shaded in, in um, gray? has ORI code, EBOH0380Z. See that? That's the code you need for the background check. That tells Deontis when this background check is done, this is the filing cabinet it has to go to. Because in Florida, they're not allowed to cross-reference background checks. 
We voted on this like eight years ago. Florida said, no, we don't want that. So now you get to get a background check done for every industry because they can't share. Okay? So medical can only access medical. Good? But you need this ORI code for them to know where to send this. So you get your background check done. You make your appointment. You go to it. They take fingerprints. They take a picture. You sign. You leave. That's it. They're not going to give you anything. You don't take anything anywhere. You don't mail anything in. You just go to the appointment. Everything is done electronically from there. Good? Okay. Now, I've heard, I don't know for sure, but I've heard that you can get these done at the um, sheriff's office now, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I haven't had anybody do it successfully. So if you try that route and it works, let me know so then I can add them to the list. But I haven't had anybody do that successfully yet. I know Deontis works. That's why I give you that one. Once you get your background check done, 24 hours later, you can register for the test. Remember, I have test and registration instructions. We're going to go through the paper application in a second. Once you register for the test, you're going to register as an E3 challenger. Once you submit your registration, either online or by mail, about one to three days later, you're going to get an email from Prometric. You want to make sure that it says application status complete. And the FBI background says record found. If that says record not found, that means they didn't find a background check on file for you. Everything stops there. They don't, that's it. Everything stops. So you need to make sure you have a level two photo enabled background check on file. When you get this email, make sure it says record found. Okay, good. So once you get this email, it says registration complete, record found, yay, good job. You just sit back and wait seven to 10 days. You'll get another email with your testing date. So what's happening between that seven and 10 days? Well, when Prometric gets your application, they have to pull your background check, attach it to it, and send it to the Board of Nursing. The Board of Nursing, a live human, this is an eyes on event not electronic. A real human looks at your application and your background check and makes sure that you are safe to work in healthcare. Once they do that, they close the file, they send it back to Prometric and says, this person is eligible to test. Once Prometric gets that back, they assign you a test date and email it to you. Now, if you don't like the test date they picked for you, you can call them up right then and say, that date doesn't work for me. While we're on the phone, let's find one that does. If you wait until two days before your test to call them up and say, this date doesn't work for me, they're going to charge you the whole fee again. So if you know the date doesn't work, you need to let them know right away. Good? Questions? How much is the fee? 155. And how much is the background check? Right around 80. Okay, so let's look at the registration form real quick. There's a couple things that I want to bring to your attention. The rest of it you can fill out on your own. Page one, this page, there's a box that you're going to check if you need ADA accommodations. Like if you have a seeing eye dog or a sign language interpreter, you need to check that box. Below that is your demographic information. You're going to fill that out. That's going to follow over on page two, demographics. You know how to fill that out. That's all your information. Go down to this section here. Medicare, Medicaid, fraud questions. Page two. Page two. I know I'm going through real quick. We're way late. <laughs> okay, everybody with me? Page two. Medicare, Medicaid, fraud has anybody in here ever worked in medical, anywhere in medical, and had a judge tell you that you are ineligible to work in medicine ever again because of Medicare fraud? Does that apply to anybody? Okay. Your answers to one, two, three, and four. I'm sorry. Your answers to three and four are going to be no. 
If you have a felony in your background, see me after class. If you have no felonies in your background, one and two or no. One and two or no. If you have never worked in medical and had a judge tell you that you can't work in medical, your answers to three, four, and five are no. One and two or no. If you have no felonies, one and two or no. If you've never been told that you can't work in healthcare, three, four, and five are no as well. Skip all the A's, B's, C's, and D's. Oh, they don't count. So basically, all is no. Right. Those should all be no. Moving on to page three. Disciplinary history. If you've ever had a medical certification in Florida or any other state and you had disciplinary action taken against you, that's what these questions are for. If you've never had a medical certification, the answer is no to all four of those questions. But you can read them and answer them at your will. At the bottom of page three, criminal history, you can answer that. Page four, health history, you answer those. Let's go to page five. What are we checking off here? E3, e3 challenger. So on the top of page five, check E3 challenger. And training information only applies if we checked E1 or E2. What did we check? E3. E3. So that doesn't apply to us. Put a big old X through it. That way when you get home, you're not tempted to try to fill it out. So put an X through training information. Just like this. Just like that. Sorry. Where we are now? On page five. So we, we need to choose the E3, right? E3. And then this is... Okay. Training information, you put an X through it. Okay. okay. Now, how many of you guys are planning on registering online? Okay. When you're registering online, the online application is exactly the same as this, except the training site information you're going to choose a regional test site. So put an X in that box, regional test site. And there, it's going to have a drop down box for you to choose the test site you want. And just pick the one in Tampa. Okay. Pick the one in Tampa. You're just going to use this as a template. Oh, okay. If you're registering online, you're just using this as a template. So it'll go down to Tampa. Yeah. If you're going to mail this in, remember this first page I gave you? Remember this? At the bottom, these are our codes for our local testing centers at the bottom. Okay. Oh, so you can see the one for Tampa. So this, the Tampa one is for the physical test? It's for both. You're going to take the written test and the skills test there on the same day. Oh, okay. Yeah. After your background check, right. Because they have to be able to find your background check to put it with your application. Okay. If you've already got a level two on uh, on file for medical, you can apply right away. If you already have one for medical, you can apply right away because there'll be one in that filing cabinet. Okay, exam fees at the, I know guys, I'm late, I'm sorry. Exam fees at the bottom, you'll see the first one, clinical skills and written, both in English. That's the one most of you will pick if you want the computer to read the questions to you. Choose the second option. Either way, the fee is 155 And then page six is just your affidavit and signature. Page seven is all about payment because they want to get paid. Yes. Can you explain a little bit these two options like clinical skills and reading, both in English? What that, what, 
What is the difference between one and another? Okay, so the clinical skills have to be done in English no matter what. Okay, I know that. The written test can be done in English or Spanish. Oh. The written test, you can have a computer read the questions to you. So you would want to choose, if you want the computer to read the test to you, you want to choose the oral oh. selection. So if I want to read myself, is the first one. That would be the first one. Oh, okay. I understand better when I read it than when I hear it. Yeah. Okay, so then you would just read page six and, and fill out page seven if you're mailing it in. If you're doing it online, you're going to submit your payment information right online. You're just using this as a template. Good? Okay. Any questions? All right. Uh, let's, uh, okay, uh, Caitlin. Oops, yep, yep, stop. Stop, okay. Uh, what happened? What is my computer doing? Okay. Caitlin, go ahead and start putting the uh, congratulations up. So on Wednesday, at the end of class, we're going to congratulate everybody who stopped by to let us know that they passed the state exam. So these are people that um, have let us know over the last week or so <coughs> that they passed the state exam. Jorge passed, so we're going to congratulate Jorge. Congratulations. Sarah, 2013. Congratulations. Wallon Pierre. Congratulations. Stella Kimboy, congratulations to you. Shania Lane, congratulations. Welcome to the wonderful world of healthcare. And if you're testing soon, make sure you stop by any of my videos. Let me know so we can congratulate you on an upcoming Wednesday afternoon after class. So I hope you guys all have a fantastic weekend. Please remember, you've got to read chapters five and six and take the test for both in your, your uh, white book. If you have any questions, please let me know. I know that I kept you late. I'm very sorry, and I know that I went through this very qu quickly, and I'm very sorry about that as well. But remember, I have all the instructions for you on our website under test registration instructions. I walk you through it, make it easy. All right, uh, review sheet is here. Grab one on your way out, and I will see you guys on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. So Happy caregiving.